Hey guys, this is Bruce and welcome to another Combo Courses podcast. I'm going to be talking about plan uh, PL controls, which is planning the planning family. Uh, it goes into system security plans, uh, privacy plans, um, and I believe privacy impact assessments and other types of documents. And we're going to, I'm just going to give you an overview of how those work and what they are. And um, and then I'll just open topics just like we do every week. And you can ask me any kind of cybersecurity, GRC type questions, any kind of open topics. I'll also go into the comments that I've been getting on TikTok and on YouTube. But feel free anytime to ask me questions. I'll go back a little bit later and answer the questions. All right. So let me get right into this. I'm going to be talking to you about PL controls. Let me bring up my screen here. PL controls for security, um, system security plans, and operations. So what you're looking at here is the NIST 800 system security plans. Um, these are breaking down the policies, the system security plans that you have to do, the uh, rules of behavior within your organization, um, concept of operations. It's just a lot of documentation that your organization should have if, if um, they're trying to create a robust uh, security compliance atmosphere. So let, let me, first of all, let, let me back up a little, a little bit. Let me just explain like why, why you would have to do this. Why, what, what would be the purpose of this type of documentation? A lot of times, as I've been doing GRC all these years, uh, whenever I'm talking to my more technical people who are doing firewalls or they're the network engineers or whatever, they they don't understand why you have to do documentation. They can for the life of them, they cannot understand why all this documentation is necessary in GRC. When we say GRC, we're talking about governance, risk, and compliance. That's how well does our organization line up to federal regulations, state regulations, industry regulations. If you don't think those are important, think about whenever you go to a hospital. You, If you're in the hospital and you're giving them all of your medical records, all of your medical information, you do want them to protect your information, right? So th the way that they do that is with documentation. They do that with all the proper procedures that you have to do. It's not just a firewall. You know, it's not just network security. It's not just encryption. It's, it's the process. The process is the part that's the most important or equally important to your encryption, to your firewall, to your, to all that stuff, your education in your, in the organization, all those procedures are super important. Nine times out of 10, these hacks are happening because people in the organization are not doing what they're supposed to do with the procedures and the processes. That's why most of the hacks happen. If you look at most of the hacks, somebody is giving the information away. Somebody is giving their password out. Somebody is... It's, it's a lack of education. It's a lack of procedures that they're supposed to do. And that's why it's really important. The more important your organization is, the more important it is to have these pro procedures in place. Whenever I'm talking to more technical, my more technical people, your pen testers, your, you know, your firewall guys, your, your server, your system a analyst, your, your uh, administrators, whoever, they cannot for the life of them understand why procedures are important, why documentation is important. It's because the weakest link is pe the weakest link in an organization is the people. That's the reason why. And if we don't have procedures in an organization, no people don't know what to do. They don't know, they don't know what information like to you is probably you feel like it's obvious. Well, obviously, we don't share this information. Obviously, we do X, Y, and Z, but it's not obvious. You know, especially within large organizations where you're dealing with lots of different types of information. That's why GRC, that's why policy and procedures are super important. And that's why I stay remain gainfully employed. Now, that being said, let's talk about some of the documentation that you have to do. Today, we're focusing on what's called um, PL controls. So let me switch the screen here. So these are PL controls. So let's start at the beginning. The PL controls has to have some sort of policy and procedure. Policy and procedure normally encapsulates 
all of the other things that you do within a control. It's 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 simple to understand. It's not so easy to implement. <laughs> it's very easy. It's very straightforward, but it's not easy to implement. Um, the implementation of it, even the writing of it, is is the difficult part. Uh, but the understanding is very straightforward. So in our policy and procedure, we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, the system security plans that a system security plan must be done. We're gonna say in there that we have to have certain rules of behavior. We're gonna have to we're gonna say things like um, annually we conduct privacy impact assessments. Anytime a new system comes in, we're gonna conduct an impact a privacy impact assessment. Now, very briefly, go over what each one of these things are. So the the policy is overarching and it kind of, and I'm going to give you an example of a policy, but right now I want to just talk about what an organization should see, what you should see in a policy. Um, and here's the kind of language that the NIST uh, uses, okay? Develop the organization. So they don't like, they don't speak in plain English and I, I don't know why they, they write these things like this. They're trying to write to all audiences, but they're, it, it's like, they try to be so broad that it like it loses its meaning. But I can explain what's going on here. So let's just read it word for word what's going on. And then I'll explain the why and how and, and what, what's going on here. So this control, PL1, is referring to the policy and procedures for planning. So it says uh, develop, document, and disseminate to assignment, organization, define, uh, organizationally defined personnel and roles. So see what they're saying here in this one is that the organization will develop, document, and disseminate or push out or publish to whoever they deem necessary that needs to hear it. That's what they're saying in this first part. And what are they going to have in there? They're going to define, the. they're going to address the purpose of the document, the scope of the, po of the document, the roles of the document, the responsibilities. Every policy has this breakdown, just like what you're seeing here, has that exact breakdown for the federal government. Um, now, what are we going to have in it? What are we going to have inside of the policy? This tells you what you're going to have in the planning policy. Now, let me just kind of break this down before I go any further. You should know that most of these documents with policies, what they'll do is they'll they'll put all of the They'll have one big umbrella policy that addresses the plan, the PL controls, which is planning, AC controls, which is um, access controls, AU controls, which is like audit logs, uh, PE controls, which is physical and environmental controls. They'll usually have one big umbrella policy that kind of addresses at a high level everything. It'll say things like our organization in accordance with this or that law will have a system security plan that documents all the security controls for each critical system. It'll say something like that. That's broad enough to where it, whatever type of organization, whatever kind of system you have, you can go ahead and put it in there and, and that and that this policy will cover it. So it that policy has to be broad. All right. When you get into procedures, that's different. Procedures is usually system specific or process specific. It's talking about a specific thing, but policies are overarching. So that's why the language in this is kind of broad. So let's keep going here with this and we'll we'll get into this real quick. I just want you guys to understand like what is a policy for planning. So the planning policy, planning policy and procedures for control PL, uh, PL family implemented within the system and organization, the risk Strategy, the risk management strategy is an important factor to establishing the policy and procedures. All right, there you go right there um, without going any too much further. What we're saying here is that in this plan, in this policy that's addressing our PL controls, we have a breakdown. We have a breakdown of the strategy, the risk management framework strategy. Some organizations actually don't have this. So some organizations actually will not address. And I know this sounds crazy, like you're, if especially if you're a cybersecurity person, you're working in this field. I'm speaking from some from experience. There are organizations who literally do not have. A what I'm reading here, they do not have it. They don't have a strategy. They don't have a 
a system security plan that defines this. They don't have anything saying, hey, all everybody in our organization will get training. Everybody in our organization, every system that gets connected will have a document that breaks down what's going on with that system. Some some organizations do not have this. And when they don't, pro that's when a lot of the problems happen, especially when they start to scale. They start to get bigger. The organization starts to get bigger. More and more clients, more and more customers, more and more users start to use their system, especially when there's important data that they're protecting, important information, and they don't have a system security plan. It's a nightmare. And what happens is people don't want to stay there, especially cybersecurity and IT people don't want to stay there because it's too hard to manage. Or you have one person who stay, who's been there since, since the beginning and they know everything. And that one person can't leave. Like if they leave, nobody knows anything because there's no documentation for, for what's going on. Documentation, it, it allows you to have con, um, continuity. Like if this person leaves, the firewall person leaves, a new firewall can come in, guy can come in or lady can come in and start reading. OK, here's what they were doing with the rules. Here's why they did a certain uh certain zones that they they needed here's why here if the system goes down another thing continuity system goes completely dark it goes down now they got to bring in a whole another firewall and stand it up from scratch you have to have the documentation in place so that you can just start to build it you can like literally take the document and say okay here's what they did here here's what they did here that's why a system security plan is super important that breaks down all the controls and even explains sometimes why you wouldn't have a certain control in there that's equally important. So let's keep going here. Um, I'm not going to beat the, this one into the ground. Um, we already talked about documentation. The part of the PL planning that's really important is going to be the system security plan. And I have an example of a system security plan here that I want to show you. Um, but first, let me kind of give you a bird's eye view of what, we, what we're talking about when we're talking about the system security plan. So system security plan, what is that? Why do I keep saying that word over and over again? <laughs> uh, there's many different names for this document, but essentially what this does is it documents all the security controls that you have in your on a specific system or in your environment. So what is it going to do? Assist a security and privacy plan for a system is going to be. Uh, these are consistent with the organization's enterprise architecture. Um, so it addresses the actual system, um, explicitly defines the constituent, the parts of the components of the system, uh, of the system. So it's going to actually define what's on there. So what servers are there, what literal hard drive, uh, hard hardware is there, what software is there, that kind of thing. Um, it's going to describe the operational context of the system. What is the mission? What is the business? What are the processes? What are the business essential processes? What are the critical functions of the organization, of that system, right? Super important because you got to have the context of the system. So there's a whole bunch of things that this does. It's really, what it's really doing here is it's defining the system. That's really what it's doing. It's defining the who, what, when, where, and why of the system from a security perspective and a privacy perspective. So you're, you're talking about what is the name of the system? Uh, what is the concept of operation? Why, why do we even have the system? Why do we need it? Um, who, who, is, who are the stakeholders of the system? Who, who do I talk to to get this thing authorized? Who, how do we do the privacy? Who do we contact for them? It's the who, what, when, where, and why. Where? Where is the system located? What? What? places it are is it on multiple sites where is it at so who what when where and why is what the system security plan is addressing from a security perspective and now let me give you an example of what these look like and this is just one example there's many different iterations and form uh, forms and functions of a system security plan so don't think that this is like a one size fits all thing let me show you what what it looks like, what it used to, what these used to look like. So this is just a spreadsheet that's breaking down the who, what, when, where, and why. It starts off with what is the name of the system? This is an old DSS system security plan uh, that is no longer available. You can get it off my site for free because um, I managed to salvage it before they scrapped it um, because people still use manual methods of, of documenting system security plans, even though um, the 
what's going on right now these days is they're doing all these in a database, like they're doing it in Exacta or Emas or some kind of database online system that allows multiple people to access a system. But for the purposes of, of teaching, I wanted to just show you the who, what, when, where, and why that goes into a system security plan. Once you've seen one and been through one, you, you can get through any one of these things. That's the great thing about GRC. It's the great thing about system security, uh, the, about being a cybersecurity um, person who's doing policy, a policy, a policy officer or information system security officer, is that it's kind of evergreen. Once you know one part, you kind of, you, if I see another system security plan somewhere else and it's not even a, it doesn't look like this, it's a Word document, I know exactly what I'm looking at. All right. So it's describing what type of system it is. Is it a standalone system? Is it a, is it a, on a WAN? Is it a LAN system? Uh, what, where is it located? Uh, what are the, what's the category of the information? What is the information type? What is the confidentiality of the system? What is it? So who, what, when, where, and why of the system? And then it goes into greater detail about the actual um, controls. What you're looking at here that you can barely see it. There's so many of them. There's literally like a thousand of them. That's why it's so tiny. Is all the security controls. Now, you wouldn't put all of these security controls on a given system. You wouldn't put all of them there. You would tailor this. So, for example, let me see. Let me get a good one here. Yeah, here's here's a good one right here. This is AC19. If you don't have mobile devices or if you don't have wireless AC19, you obviously you wouldn't use you wouldn't have to use that control. You just put not applicable. And then the explanation would be we don't have wireless on this system. This this is a internal system. It's a, it's a classified system. It's a whatever system. We don't have we don't allow any kind of wireless. You would just explain that in the documentation. All of this is about this PL control family is about explaining and documenting what is going on from a security or privacy perspective on each individual system. That's all it is. From the architecture to the actual concepts of operations to the, the privacy uh, impact analysis forms, all of it is just describing what the system looks like. And there's many different, I can't sit here and tell you um, that everyone uses this spreadsheet because they don't. <laughs> it looks different every time. Uh, it looks completely even use different language. I've been I've worked in right now. I'm working in the federal space, but I've worked in aerospace. I've worked in Department of Defense and intelligence. I've worked in the private sector. They all use different language. They use they have different acronyms. They call it slightly different words, but it's all the same. It's all the same. They all have to put the industry standard best practices on their system, the security best practices. And this, what I'm teaching you right now is one of the security best practices, which is a plan, a system security plan. Um, they don't always call it a system security plan. They don't always call it that. <laughs> They've called, I've, I've been in places where they call it um, uh, information, information system plan. I've heard it called, uh, they call a security policy, but it's actually a system security plan. I've, I've seen it called, many different things that sometimes they don't have a name for it. They'll just say, oh, go to Exacta, you know, go to Exacta and log into the system. Like, but it's a system security plan. I'm like, there it is, a system security plan. Uh, NIST actually has a really good breakdown of what should be inside of a system security plan. Let me show you that. It's NIST 18, uh, NIST 818. So if you're wondering like uh, where you would find like a complete breakdown or standard for this, here it is right here, NIST 18. Actually, let me switch my screen real quick. There it is right here. It's NIST 800-18. Uh, and it just tells you like what should be in every system security plan, whether you have a database version of it, whether it's a, a spreadsheet, whether it's, it's going to be a Word document or a PDF or whatever, it's breaking down everything you should have in there. And what you're seeing here is um, it's going to describe what, who the responsible people are in it, um, uh, where are the system boundaries? That's a really important uh, one. What type of system it is. You might not have anything like a major applications or general support system or minor applications. Your organization might f call it totally something totally different. You might have a different naming uh, conventions for different systems that are within your environment, and that's fine. 
But what you need to know is a system security plan describes the who, what, when, where, and why of a given system. That's what you really need to know. If you take nothing else from this, that's what you really need to know about a system security plan. Okay, let me cover one other thing, and then I'll go to uh, some of my comments if I have any. Uh, let me see here. Let me go to the next part of the PL controls because there's there's a lot more of them. I'm not going to cover all of them, but what I just wanted you to get an idea of what the PL controls entail, like what what is going on with the PL controls. So PL, going back to the family of controls here. Um, let me let me show you guys what I'm looking at here. The PL control family is a couple other ones that I'm just going to what I'll do is cover the ones that are, are most important if, as a system security person, because there's some that are very kind of specialized that you don't normally have to really know unless it's uh, pertinent to that a given system. Uh, let me see. Policy, you're always going to have to do something with that one. So that's why I covered it. And then system security plan. This is always it's always going to be pertinent. It's always going to be something that you need to know. Um, updates um, that kind of goes without saying, making sure you update that on a regular basis. Rules of behavior is something most of us are familiar with. If you've ever worked at any job and, and logged into any system at any job, whether, whether it's retail or banking or healthcare or whatever, you'll notice that there's always a rules of behavior document. A They call it a user agreement. If you've ever signed a user agreement document, that's the rules of behavior. So if you ever actually read it before you signed it, It'll say, <laughs> it'll say um, something like, um, I will, you know, I, I'm not going to sign, I'm not going to uh, go to porn sites. I'm not going to go, it doesn't specifically say that, but basically that's what it's saying. I'm not going to go into un, any unauthorized sites. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to click on any unauthorized. I'm not going to do business at my place of work. I'm not going to, there's rules that they have uh that that you signed off on when you actually got the job that's rules of behavior that's pl4 um it, privacy impact assessment this one right here will come up from time to time the rest of these are um baseline selection is going to be important at some point but this one right here i feel like i should cover real quick from a high level i've did a whole if you're interested in privacy i did an entire breakdown of privacy um that I that is on my site, um, and you could actually find bits and pieces of it for free on YouTube, where I just go into very great detail about privacy impact assessments and PTAs or privacy threshold and analysis and every all the stuff that goes into this. But I'm just gonna give you like an overview of a of a privacy impact assessment real quick. Let me see. One of the best places that I've found that has a really good resource for privacy impact assessments is uh, DHS. DHS has a really good breakdown on their public site that talks about privacy impact assessments. And it's it's high levels, very good uh, for, for learning. So they go into privacy here. Uh, let me see, training. Let me see if I, you can follow along with me. If I, all I did was go to Google and type in uh, DHS privacy. Now let me make sure I'm showing my screen here. Yep. Nope. Uh, hold on a second. Give me a second, guys. I've got too much stuff open here. Doing too many things at once. Did this thing just shut down on me? Oh, no, it didn't. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> I was showing the screen the whole time. Okay. Privacy. Let me see. There's a really good breakdown that I'm looking for for privacy impact assessment. Here we go. Privacy compliance. You go to privacy compliance with DHS, Department of Homeland Security, publicly available information. Uh, this is a great breakdown of the entire privacy process. PL, was it PL5, um, is talking about this right here. Let me actually maybe make sure. Yeah, PL5. PL5 is talking about this process right here. This one part of the process, by the way. So privacy threshold analysis is make is what it's doing is is taking a new system and saying okay does this system have any privacy on it that's what we're doing with privacy threshold analysis and if it does have privacy information pii is what's called uh it's personally identifiable information 
if it does have personally identifiable information, what are we doing with this information? Um, is is talked about in privacy impact analysis. But in this first part, privacy threshold is saying, okay, this new system, do we have privacy? Do we have PII? What type of PII do we have on it? So we can determine what level of, of uh, security that we need. Once you determine that this system, yes, it does indeed have PII and we know what type it is. Now you're gonna go into privacy impact analysis. What is the impact to our organization if this privacy data was leaked? How important is this? How critical is this privacy impact now, uh, impact information? So think of it like this. You have different types of privacy, right? Of uh, PII. So your first name, your last name, your middle initial, that is a type of PII. That's personally how, how people can identify you, you individually, okay? That's one thing, that's one part. And that's that's kind of high level. I mean, most sites is gonna uh, could have your name or whatever, or whatever username that they could associate with your real name or something like that. When you get into phone numbers, okay, now you're getting a little bit deeper. Now they can link your phone number with your your full name. That's that's a little bit deeper. Now you get into social security numbers, right? Now the impact of losing to social security numbers and to be able to map that to an individual's name and their date of birth, that, that's huge. That's a huge impact if that data was to get out. So in, a privacy impact analysis, a privacy impact assessment is going to determine how, how much protection do we need on that PII information. If it's just a username associated with a first and last name, okay, that's, okay, that, that's, there's something there. But if we have that in association with a social security number and a date of birth or whatever it, okay that has a different level of security that we need to that we need to protect and all of that documentation is done in accordance with this particular security control pl5 and pl5 breaks this down let me see if i can show you guys what i'm talking about here pl5 is going into greater detail and this was let me see this was transferred to p r a r a eight wow okay so let's look at RAA. So, okay, let me just let me just uh, explain what what's going on with this. So, this right here, um, NIST eight hundred was recently changed from revision four to revision five, and here's one of the changes that happened was that they moved the PL five to RAA, and I sh actually should have known that. So my bad. <laughs> Uh, so let me let me just show you the uh, PL since we're to already talking about PI, PIA stuff. So let me go back. If you guys want to follow along, if you're wondering like what site I'm on that has all this information, it's in the link. I put it actually in the link in the description on YouTube. If you're following along with me there, uh, all this stuff is online. It's you can download the entire all every single one of these controls. It breaks everything down in great great detail. Let me go to RA. Okay, here are every one of the controls of which there's hundreds broken down. And once you break each one of these down, it's like literally thousand over a thousand. So P A R A. Okay, so R A controls. If you want to go to the individual families of controls, it breaks down further. Here's okay, here's P I A right here that they recently changed from PL. This breaks down what you see in an impact, a privacy impact uh, assessment. Everything that you need to actually do this work is all, it's all in these documents. The wording is crazy, but um, if you have the patience to actually to do this, uh, it's all there. Somebody asked me, and I'm going to go to questions here. Somebody asked me, uh, where do you find examples of your SSP? Um, actually, if you're interested in getting examples, it's on combocourses.com where I put these. I put the these out there for free. I have a whole bunch of free downloadables if you're interested in uh, in that. And one of those downloadables is a system security plan. Different versions of it. I have a Word document one. I've got a. Um, 
a spreadsheet version of it in different forms. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. So if you go to, yeah, here it is right here. It's called NIST 800 Templates. And um, so many people are downloading this. Maybe I should charge for it. So yeah, here it is right here. If you're interested, go to Combo Courses, go to All Courses, and then search for NIST 800 Templates. It looks like this. It's got a, some downloadables. You download everything here. And here's one example of a system security plan right here. I've got the word. The word one is a lot more easy to understand, but I also have the, the actual. Um, and if you if you're actually trying to learn this stuff, um, I would re highly recommend uh, my book. Combo courses go to if it's on Amazon, actually here it is on Amazon where I'm explaining all this stuff. Here is right here. If you're interested in it, uh, just type in NIST 800 security. It's also in my uh, link in bio. I'm going to open this up to questions. If you have any questions whatsoever, uh, I've got a couple questions in here. Let me see. Somebody said a uh, quick question. Would you say the industry is moving to risk aware awareness culture instead of GRC? I would say uh, GRC in GRC includes risk awareness, so it's a part of risk awareness. Um, GRC is where is the direction things are going to, and that's actually a great question because um, recently one of the certifications that I have that's one of the premier. Uh, certifications on information security and GRC stuff, they actually changed the name of it from ISC2 CAP or Certified Authorization Professional to Certified in GRC. So the whole industry is moving towards GRC, um, that, that naming convention, convention. But I can tell you that security risk awareness is a part of GRC. GRC literally means governance, risk, and compliance. So risk is risk. Risk includes risk responses that the organization has to do, risk awareness that the organization has to have, uh, risk scoring. Ri there's risk management. All of those things are encompassed in the risk part of GRC. So yeah, um, let me see if there's any other questions here. And speaking speaking of that, let me show you guys like the recent change. If you're interested in um, in doing a GRC type certification, uh, CAP is one of the ones I have, and I would I would highly recommend it. It's it's a pretty good certification um, for for this field. But ISC two squared uh, CAP recently sent me an email. I accidentally went to somebody's website here. Here is, okay, let me show you guys what I'm talking about. If you're interested in this, I get a lot of people asking questions about, um, about certifications, so I figure I should talk about it a little bit. This is CAP, the CAP certification. It's focused on the stuff I was just teaching you, like um, all of the security controls, specifically with the NIST security controls, NIST Risk Management Framework specifically 800 family this right here is what i was teaching you just now like if you guys have whoever's been like listening this whole time part of what i was teaching you is this right here so this certification is now changing to to this grc governance risk and compliance and my thinking on this is that they're doing this because it it's a it's a marketing thing ISC2 is really smart about marketing their certifications. They're smart about how they name the certifications. They're smart about how they market and they they go to the main players. They're going to they market directly to the government, directly to a specific industry as a whole. And they got a lot of B2B business because of that. And I think that it's a it's just a marketing thing. And I, I actually it's really good because um, a lot of times people don't know what the cap is. In other industries, they don't know what IC2 cap is, and they're I'm I am what they're looking for because they they're looking for a person who knows the NIST 800 family and how how the risk management framework works. 
but they don't know that ISC2 cap has anything to do with risk. So, so yeah, I think it's a great move of what they're doing. Uh, and I see people trying to join me on TikTok, but um, the last time I let somebody join, it was it was chaos. So um, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm hesitant to do that um, just yet. Maybe one of these days I'll I'll start doing the the lives. Let me see. Uh, let me see if I got any other questions or any other things going on. Um, I did have a question about where to find where to find. Um, the downloadables I've been talking about. If you're interested in finding the downloadables, Raquel, then uh, just go to ComboCourses.com and search for NIST 800 templates. It's going to look a little something like this. If you're interested in grabbing these, these templates, it's got not only system security plan, but it's got a breakdown of, uh, of the SAP, the security as assessment uh, plan and, um, other documents that you might you might want to use and it's free so let me see if there's any other questions and i think i'll ask answer some soon since there's not a lot of questions what i want to do is i want to answer some questions i've been i've been pretty busy um i apologize for people who have been messaging me emailing me and stuff and i have not been getting back because i've been i've been super busy um with my job let me see recently got got a job here so starting to get more busy i can't just do lives out of nowhere and, and just do nothing but my business now i have to only do it on the weekends unfortunately okay somebody said to me let me switch the screen so you guys can see what i see here on TikTok, if you happen to still be following along, if not, no big deal. You know, I'm gonna rec I'm recording this, so I'll I'm gonna repost all this in little bite-sized pieces at some point. Okay, so somebody asked me on average, do you think uh, do you think information system security jobs pay more than analyst positions? That's the question. So I can answer this question. Um, it depends on the position. It depends on location. Salary, what you'll notice is that salary really depends on the location. Location depends on the position itself. Those are the main two things. Uh, and of course, your skill set, what you bring to the table. But the main two things, location. For example, in Omaha, Nebraska or Wisconsin, they're going to pay a lot less than, say, Somebody on the East Coast in um, Maryland, D.C. area pays a lot more. And I can give you an example uh, of some jobs. So if, if we go to let me just. Here's what we'll do. I'm going to type in I it's it's so salary. And right off the bat, they're saying that the ISO salary here, let me show you my screen here. The ISO salary is. Uh, an average in the U.S. of a hundred, a hundred thousand, hundred eighteen thousand per year. On average in the U.S., but this really depends on what location, what location you're in. Because let me see if I can give a further breakdown. We're gonna look at the analyst stuff too, but look at this. So we're seeing a hundred and four on average, according to Glassdoor. But it depends on number your how much experience you have. Like if you have four years experience, it's going to be different than if you have zero to one years of experience as opposed to nine years of experience. And then it also depends on the industry. One thing they don't have here is the location because that is that's a real big one. OK, here we go. Let's see. Well, let's say uh, Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska is going to pay a lot less, I believe, than than at some other locations. So I want me to sign in. I don't want to sign in. I think it's saying like 120 there for Omaha, Nebraska. It's not showing me, but Omaha, Nebraska. Let's see. Now watch this. Let's go to. Oh, here's how what we can do. We'll type in Omaha, Nebraska right here. Let's look. See, look at this. The average in Omaha, Nebraska 
is about 87. According to this site, about 87. Um, but what let's look at let's look at the salary and oh wait, here's another one. 99 900 90,000, 90,000 right there. Just shy of a hundred thousand. Now let's look at Maryland. Maryland. Um, missing a Y here. Maryland. So Maryland, you're making a little bit, a little bit more in Maryland. Average on average. So location really matters when you're talking about price. So the other one in in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, it was under a hundred thousand, and then the average in Baltimore, Maryland, is a little over a hundred thousand. Baltimore, Maryland. Now let's look at the the real question was a cybersecurity analyst versus an ISO. Let's look at this cybersecurity analyst salary in Maryland. Uh, it's about a hundred thousand, a little over a hundred. So it looks, it's looking like the ISO was is is uh more on average, even in Maryland. So this is Maryland. Even it's going as low as uh sixty seven k per year, but it really depends on the position. Because look at this one. This one's up to one hundred and fifty nine thousand a year, which is not bad. It's kind of in the same ballpark, but. An ISO is making a little bit more overall, I'd say, uh, in Maryland. And let's look at Omaha, Nebraska, or just anywhere in Nebraska. Location really matters. I mean, look at this. It's a lot less. So to answer the question, I can answer the question. Like, it, Just looking at the data, we can clearly see that ISOs are, are getting paid a lot are getting paid more on average than your average ISO is making more than your average cybersecurity analyst. But that's not to say that an analyst can't make more. It depends on the job and location, I'd say. So that's how I'd answer that one. Uh, let me see if I have another question. Uh, let me see. If there's any other questions, and I'll look at TikTok too. Let me see. Okay, talking about scammers. Scammers, man, that's a popular one. Oh, okay, here's here's one. Somebody commented on. Where is it? I just missed it. Emotional intelligence, okay. Thank you for being transparent on emotional intelligence and speaking out on various personalities. Yeah. So this is something I talk about quite often about cybersecurity is that cybersecurity takes a certain level of, of emotional intelligence that um, that some IT professionals don't have. A lot of the people in IT, no offense, um, they're not they're not very personable. They're not very um, they're not smart emotionally. I know it sounds like a crazy foo-foo thing, but it's absolutely real. It is absolutely real. I, I'll give you a story about it. I, when I was in the military, I was doing IT, and I got stationed in uh, somewhere in the Middle East. Um, it, it was called Prince Sultan Air Base at the time. It no longer exists. Uh, but we had to set up this network. We had like four networks. We had like a NATO network and then like a secret network and then a like whatever network. And we had this cluster F of networks that didn't work properly because somebody didn't configure them correctly. Um, because they didn't configure them correctly, we would have congestion. We would have routing issues where the data is going in a circle. You have just all kinds of routing all kinds of security issues, all kinds of just all kinds of issues, like stuff I don't even feel comfortable talking about, even though the base no longer exists and that network's gone. Um, there was one dude who came in from. He was coming in from Washington because we had people who were like reservists come in. I don't know if he was a reservist or if he was active duty, but this dude 
was the smartest person I'd ever seen at that point on routers. This dude, he could set up routing tables. He could set up routing uh, protocols. He, he, like that stuff gets really complicated. If you've ever done network engineering, it gets really complicated. This dude knew how to do subnetting. This that we didn't know how. To, like there was only like three people at the time who knew how to do any of that stuff, and this dude knew how to do it. He knew how to do everything on a router, and he was the only one. So our uh, at the time our chief who was like a lieutenant. He was like, okay, hey, I want you to teach everybody how to do these basic tasks. I swear to you, this man, this brilliant man could not for the life of him teach anybody anything. For him, it was, he just knew it, but he could not teach it. He could not explain what he knew. And he just knew how to do it. And as brilliant as he was, he just could not teach. And I thought it was him. I was like, this guy, something's wrong with this guy. And what I found out was like, not a lot of people can teach. Either they don't have the patience to do it. They think everybody else should just know things, which is weird to me. <laughs> they assume that everybody is at their level. And they, when you teach, you got to teach at a person's level. You got to speak with their language. You can't just, people don't automatically speak your language. You know? <laughs> to me, it's just, it's natural. But to this guy who was brilliant, this man could not teach anything. And you know what the, ir the irony is? When I talk to this guy, he could barely string a couple sentences together with anybody. But he's was, he was absolutely brilliant, but he could barely talk. I think he was extremely autistic and had Asperger's disease. Like the guy, the guy was absolutely, he was a savant. He was a, he was like, Rain, have you ever seen the movie Rain Man? He was like Rain Man, but with with network technology. He was like if somebody dropped sticks on the ground, he could probably know how many sticks just dropped on the. This dude was absolutely ridiculously smart, but he could not t speak to people. He could not teach anyone anything. And one time I sat down, I was like, "Hey man, like, what do you like? Why are you?" It doesn't seem like you like IT. Like, what are you trying? What do you want to do? He said he he wanted to do uh, he wanted to teach. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, oh, you want to teach, but you can't teach anything. I didn't say that, but I was what I was thinking. And this dude, was, he wanted to teach um, survival. Like his thing was survival. He was a survival guy, and he wanted to teach that. I'm like, dude, you can't. You're not. He couldn't string two sentences together. I'm not exaggerating. This man could barely talk to human beings. And you know what? I'm the most, I'm the most, one of the most introverted person people I've ever met. And this dude put me to shame. So yeah, not, this is not for everybody. <laughs> Teaching is not for everybody. Crazy, crazily enough. Okay. Somebody asked me, would you say that this field is more remote based rather than physical uh physical building where uh i would say that's a good question I, no um it's it's not remote i would say most iso jobs are definitely in the office uh most grc iso policy based jobs are in the office because especially when you're dealing with the federal government because a lot of the jobs are dealing with classified information or very sensitive information of some sort uh, whether it's in a hospital or it's in a banking industry or in cybersecurity in general, it lends itself to being in some sort of secure environment. That being said, you can find remote jobs in this field because I've been doing it since 2014 now, and I've had several jobs. I've had I literally have like seven or six jobs in that time frame where I do side jobs or I would do, or, you know, I would work for the federal government doing, uh, you can do it too. And if you're interested in this, I actually have, if you go to my uh, description, uh, description or um, in the link in description below, if you're on YouTube or if you're on TikTok, just check me out. Um, I've got like a breakdown of the lessons of how you can do it, how I've been able to do this. And actually I just, I have a book about this if you guys are interested. Uh, just released this book. I, I haven't like really advertised it yet, 
because I'm still uh, working out. What I'll do is a couple different versions of the book until I get it right. Um, let me see. Amazon. If you go to Amazon, I got a course on this too. Like if you if you go to my course, it'll walk you through how I've been able to do this. Because I just get a lot of people asking about it. But if you also you can also do this for free. This is all stuff I've been buying, man. Look at me. So much candy. Jobs. Uh I'm bear with me. I'm still I'm looking for it. I'm, I'm not sure if it's been released by Amazon just yet. Yeah, here it is right here. Um, I don't know. The paperback's the only one out right now. I'm, I'm working on the audio book of this and the, the audio book and the, um, and the uh, soft copy of this is coming out. It's, it's going to take me a while. I'm, I don't know what's going on, why it's taking so long to get this out. But here it is right here if you're interested in how to actually, how to actually uh, work from home. It's a very short book. Um, that just goes straight to the point. But also, if, if you're interested, go to um, my YouTube channel. It's probably a better resource, to be honest with you. Resource where it breaks down how I'm able to do this. Where I have a breakdown of, of, of everything I've been doing over the years to actually find these jobs. It's actually much easier now to get these jobs. Um, another book to check out while you're there is Cybersecurity marketing, cybersecurity job market, how to actually find jobs, because I've been able to find jobs very easily over the over the years. Um, just just using this very simple method that I use. No problem, no problem. All right, let me answer another. I'm going to answer a question from TikTok. This is my TikTok channel. If you guys are interested I got a ton of questions here, so I'm going to answer one, one or two of these. Have you heard of a WGU? Yes, I've heard of WGU. I think this is a, that's a great path if you want to go that direction. All right, let me see if I can answer some questions directly from TikTok. Let me see. Okay, here's here's a good Even question. Uh, somebody asked me, they asked me, which is easier, IT or cyber? Um, it, so this, this is a very broad question because, uh, cyber security is very broad and IT is, is more broad. I would say my answer to this would be that Overall, IT is easier because IT is a much bigger umbrella. So IT covers like help desk. Like IT has a, a larger spectrum. IT, cybersecurity is underneath IT. I, IT is a huge umbrella with a very broad spectrum. So IT goes from like, you can literally have no degree, have a GED, and walk in off the street on some of these jobs, and they will teach you basic IT. They're not going to pay a lot for these types of jobs, but that's where you start. That's where I started. Everybody, all of us start with IT. IT has a huge spectrum. It can go from you making $12 an hour um, doing help desk stuff all the way to being a director where you're making a million, you know, whatever with stocks a year. IT is huge. So I would say over... Overall, IT, its spectrum allows you to start. It's It, it can be much easier because you can just do basic help desk type stuff. But cybersecurity, you have to come in knowing some IT stuff. You can't just walk in knowing nothing. But IT, you can. Like you, It has that within the spectrum. But cybersecurity, you really have to know some IT stuff. So hope that answered the question. So I said, uh, hey, man, I love what you do. I will contact you soon. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yep, feel free to contact me. Uh, that's a great way to explain it. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Let me see if I can answer some other questions. Um, some other questions people have been asking me. I'll go to this time. I'm going to I'll go to YouTube. Um, I guess so many different. So much spam on YouTube these days. 
Um, let me see. So much spam and unrelated stuff. This is a great information. This is this is great information for explaining the need for defense in depth in PE during an interview from the bank. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I started as a PM working security related projects. My biggest mistake, letting my PMP lapse. I still have a CISSP, CISA, CISM, et cetera, but I, but I'm getting that PMP. Uh, yeah. Okay. This is, this is actually a really great topic right here. I want to address this real quick. Okay. So somebody said a lot of times, like, um, people are asking me like, Hey, should I get into cybersecurity? Like I'm 40, I'm, I'm 40 plus. Like, is it too late? I'm 30. Is it too late for me to get in cybersecurity? And, and what I say to them is no, absolutely not. It's not too late to get into this. Ab absolutely not. It's a great opportunity. But what I'll do suggest is maybe, maybe consider doing what's called project management. Project management is aligned with cybersecurity, is aligned with system engineering, is, is aligned with top, with uh, IT type technical engineering type stuff. And so what this job does is project management, it needs a very mature type of person who knows how to communicate well. Just like cybersecurity, it takes a person with a lot of patience, a lot of empathy, like somebody who can see from your perspective right? It takes that kind of person, but also it's pays well. And I want to show, I'm going to demonstrate to you what I'm talking about when I'm talking about project management position. And there's not like a high bar with, with cybersecurity. I feel like you already have to come in with IT knowledge. You can't come, you can come into cybersecurity with no experience, but you can't come in with no knowledge. So there's kind of a, a bar there. Not a, It's not a high bar, but there is a bar. Because you have to, you have to know um, IT, the basic IT stuff, networking, how computers work. You have to know that stuff. But with project management, you don't have to know that stuff. But we need, when I say we, IT people, risk management framework people, uh, cybersecurity people, engineers, scientists. We need project managers. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Project managers, watch this, watch this. I'm going to type in how much, pro and most people are motivated by money. So let, let's do this project, myself included, right? <laughs> project manager, okay? And I'll explain like what they do. But here's what a project manager makes. Look, that's not bad. See that? That is not bad. And actually, some project manager positions make way more than uh, cybersecurity. Some positions, look at this, look at that. That's that's a project manager. You don't have to know uh, IT stuff for this. I'm not saying that there's no bar for project management. So a PMP is a project management uh, professional. It's a certification for this job right here. It doesn't pay bad. And it uh, can make well into 100, 100K. It's not a bad um, it's not a bad gig, not at all. So if you're interested in this, if you happen to be older, maybe you don't really want to know the IT stuff or whatever, um, you should consider project management because uh, it pays well. The, the bar of entry is not super high. You know, a lot of times us older people like. It, it's. It's very humbling to be an older person doing IT stuff. And I'll tell you why. Um, you can do it. Absolutely, you can do it. And we do need everyone, we, especially older people, to be honest with you, because you need people who are emotionally intelligent, which older people tend to be. So because they have experience. But I'll just say, like, there is a learning curve. And it's very humbling when you come into this older, because when we were born, there was no there was an internet. Well, there was an internet, but it was like DARPA net or something. Like when I was born, it was DARPA net or something. Nobody was on the internet when I was a kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Except scientists and like, I don't know, Intel guys or something. You know, in the 90s was when it blew up. 
And so there's kids that you're going to be working here. Kid, When I say kids, they're 22, 25 years old. And these guys, they were born with into this. So it just seems natural for them, I've noticed. Like the younger people, when I'm working with them, it just comes natural to them. Now I've got a lot of patience as an older person to learn new things. I've always had patience, but they already know this stuff. Then they know it fast too. Like they just, it's like even when my kids, sometimes I, one time I had my kids a couple times, I had them like be my editor for my videos. I'll, I'll take my videos long form like this and I'll have them, I'll cut it up. My kids will take it. And I say, Hey, uh, could you cut this video? I'm, I, I need an editor. I'll pay you. And they're like, Oh yeah, yeah you're going to money. They're like money. Okay. You know, <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure. You know, so I was trying to teach them how to use like photo, uh, premiere, uh, Adobe premiere. And they instantly knew how to do it. I'm like, this took me, this took me literally weeks and months to learn it. And they knew it immediately, immediately. Like as I was showing them how to do it, oh, here's how you, here's the cut tool. As soon as I showed them like what the cut tool was and like, how to delete and add things. They were like, okay, got it. I'm like, what the, f <laughs> like what? Gen Z, like and millennials, like they naturally know how to do this stuff. Whereas like for me, this wasn't, none of this stuff was is natural to me, but for them, they just know it, man. So there's a learning curve, you know, so it's very humbling for an older person to learn this. I'm not saying you can't, I mean, I'm older and I learned it. So if I could do it, you could definitely do it. Okay. Let me see. Um, what if you're an introverted type uh, for work? Okay, how did you get into cybersecurity? And what if you're an introverted type? Okay, it's a great question for me because I'm I'm an introvert. Um, and um, how did I get into cybersecurity? Baptized by fire, man. So I was in the military, and I cross trained from uh, Cyber from uh, physical security. I was a security forces member. I was a MP. I was a security police officer. And I did that for like five years. And while I was there, I learned security, uh, physical security, which is not too much different. The concepts are similar to cybersecurity. Um, so it helped me a little bit in the concept, the overall concept of security. I, I understood the importance of import the importance of protecting the data and, and why you want to control access and and things like that. And actually physical security is a part of cybersecurity. But so that that part I, I got. But when I was in physical security, they forced us to um, learn to learn public speaking. They forced us by making us do it. So um, over and over again in front of a crowd. So they put us on a stage in front of all of our peers, in front of all of our coworkers, and say, "Okay, uh, speak." <laughs> they give us like a plat. Of course, we'd have like a couple paragraphs we're supposed to memorize, and we're supposed to go on in front of everybody, and then we're supposed to present it. And they would just make us do it over and over again until you got it. And the first time I did it, I, I was 19 years old, and I froze, and everyone laughed. <laughs> they laughed me off the face of the earth because it was the military and they don't give a shit about your feelings uh and then um i went down sat down and then didn't cry <laughs> but i wanted to <laughs> and my uh my uh my supervisor at the time she was a hard-nosed gorgeous staff sergeant and she just kind of pat me on the shoulders like hey what happened up there <laughs> she was um she was very caring but how did i do it baptized by fire they i just did it over and over again until um like this i didn't i'm so introverted like this right here is not natural for me speaking in in front of people like this it's not natural i just had to do it over and over again and i and i, I credit the military to just sometimes you just got to Throw some cold water on yourself and keep going. You've got to keep doing it until you until you're good at it. And you're gonna fall on your face from time to time, but that's life. But if you want to get good at something, you just gotta keep doing it over and over and over again. 
until you get it right. And you can't be discouraged. Well, you can be discouraged, but you got to keep going. You got to keep going over and over again until you get it. And as an introvert, as a fellow introvert, I can tell you it's not easy when you start. You you have all the self-doubt and um, your your own mind is going to attack you. But you have to just force yourself to do it. And um, cybersecurity, a lot of the jobs, the GRC stuff that I do, compliance, this stuff right here that's evergreen, that pays really well, you get, you're going to have to talk to people. Now, if you're doing, if you're a cybersecurity guy who's a, a firewall admin, you might not have to talk to as many people. If you're, if you're a network security guy, you might not have to talk to that many people. If you're a, if you, if you're like hands-on doing stuff, if you're, if you're a pen tester, if you're a cybersecurity analyst, though, those guys don't really talk to m many people. I did some of those jobs. I was a network uh, engineer for a bit. I was a field tech for a bit. I was a, a I did firewall stuff. Um, I did. Uh, I've done a few of those jobs and you don't really have to talk. You don't have to do meetings. You don't have to interface with many people. It's it's easier in that respect, but um, it's constantly changing. So there's pros and cons with everything. Uh, let me see. Somebody said you have to have some level of knowledge. You didn't necessarily uh, have to have a degree or bachelor's degree. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You you don't have to have experience. You don't have to have a degree necessarily, but you do have to have IT knowledge to get into cybersecurity. You, nobody's exempt from having IT knowledge. If you're doing like in in the very beginning, if you're doing straight up IT and you're doing help desk stuff, you can do. Um, you don't have to have anything like you can walk in some jobs where they'll teach you you're an apprentice and they'll teach you everything you need to know. And you can slowly build up and get your certifications or go for a degree or whatever. Now, is it better to have one? Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about A plus security plus and network plus? I have all of these certifications. I'm the right person to ask this. I'm the right person to ask this. How do I feel? The question is, how do I feel about the CompTIA? A plus, security plus, and network plus. So A plus is awesome. A plus is a really good cert first certification. First, it's really good at teaching. Like the breakdown of what you need to know is there. A plus is good and it's marketable. Like I've been noticing a lot of IT people on YouTube and on TikTok saying, don't get the CompTIA. It sucks. Don't get Opt CompTIA A plus. It sucks. That was my first certification. That certification is dope. It taught me the basics of what I needed to know. It was not an easy certification because I had to know all the terminology and all that stuff. It's it's a dope first certification. It's really good to like start. Uh, Security Plus is really good. After you get the A Plus, I would highly encourage you to get the a Security Plus. A Plus, Security Plus. Security Plus is really marketable. It's If you can go straight for the Security Plus, do that. But if you can't, I believe there's there might be some rec some prerequisites to get into even doing the security plus. But if you can do it, like if you already have a little bit of IT experience, if you like feel like you can pick it up really fast, go straight for the security plus if you if you can. But if you can't, if you're starting off from scratch, A plus first, then security plus. Network plus. I have a network plus. Um Hmm. Network Plus is not that good. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not that good. They CompTIA did their best because there's not really any there's not really any um, vendor neutral network certifications that are that are high level. Uh, what I mean by that is that most network certifications are owned by uh, some major organization like the top one is probably either Juniper or Cisco or I don't know, name your top network enterprise companies. And those guys will have, will own like the top network. Uh, another one is a uh, VMware top networking type uh, certifications. They're, they're all vendor specific. Like when you go through their course, it's like 
when you're using a Cisco router or whatever, like I used to have a CCNA and there, there's very specific Cis, the CCNA is so specific that you have to literally log into a, their router using their iOS. And that's how you pass the certification. <laughs> and then same thing with Juniper, like you have to know their technology, but network plus to its credit is vendor neutral. It's not specifically talking about this or that system. It's just talking about the actual technology. So it's good to learn like the, the stuff to learn like about what the basics of what a LAN is and what a WAN is and how to do subnet, mat, subnet, subnetting and IPs and different types of IPs. It's very basic networking stuff. So I would maybe just learn the stuff from the course, but I wouldn't take the certification because it's just not very marketable at all. Um, it's just not that marketable. So Security Plus, A Plus, highly recommended. I have all of those. I've taught those before. Um, so, yeah. Uh, can you explain how sometimes uh, how you, can you explain how sometimes manages a project with little or no IT experience? Can you explain? OK, what you mean is, can I explain how you can do project management with little or no IT experience. Okay, yes, I can explain that. So project management, um, it it's what your focus is on is how to manage large projects. And so that's not just IT stuff. That can be that can be a science project, that can be launching some stuff into space, it can be aerospace. It can be a major healthcare system that that's going to span the globe. So you your your focus is on like the tools. I th think one is called agile. There's like different techniques. Um, there's different concepts that help you to manage the system as a whole. Like, for example, let me give you a real world example. Like we had a system. We had a we had a system in um, Department of Defense, and um, we had to upgrade this system from old Unix to Red Hat. And that process we knew was going to take three point five million dollars. I'm just throwing numbers out there, and it's going to take four or five different departments, right? And it's going to have a hundred different pieces of equipment. So, but it's so this system is so complicated, it's so comprehensive. Me as a cybersecurity person, all I know is my little part. I just know that we have to have we have to use risk management framework. We have to go through the risk management framework process. I know what controls. I know where to get those controls. I know who to talk to to get those controls in place. That's my part. I don't know, say, how to stand up a Red Hat from scratch. Right. That wasn't my part of the job. That's that's the Red Hat administrators, the Red Hat administrators. Those guys, all they know is how to set up the thing from scratch. They know how to install the patches. They know how to put in the security controls. They know how to network the systems together. They know how to like they know their piece. This the uh, system engineers, the system engineers. They know how to get the telemetry data from the satellite. They know how to point the dish in a certain direction, and they have the software that's going to have the telemetry to point the thing and then pull the data down and then give it to the network guys. Each of us knows our little piece and part. And then there's the schedule. There's the schedule and the resources and all that stuff. That's where the project manager comes in. The project manager, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, I'm going to meet with the cybersecurity people. I'm going to meet with the IT people. I'm going to meet with the system engineering people. And I need a tool like a Gantt chart or like Agile or like whatever. I need some sort of like Jira or whatever, whatever tool they're going to use. And they're going to map out the time frames that each one of us are doing our job. Like they're going to say, OK, first of all, we're supposed to have this whole project done in 18 months. We have three point five million dollars to do this. In the first six months, we're going to spend 80% of that money. Now, the, the money piece, they're going to talk to a whole nother department. They're not even doing the actual finances. They're talking to a, the part, the other department that does that. And they're going to say, okay, guys, 
How long is it going to take you to acquire, purchase all of the equipment? It's going to take us four months to purchase all the equipment and go through 80% of the budget. Cool. So all they're doing is they're talking to that part, that, that piece. Let's say it's the financial acquisitions department, whatever. And they're going to say, okay, how long is it going to take? So as a project manager, they know we can't start to install until we have the equipment. So they're like, okay, it's going to take four months to get all the equipment in place. And then they're checking every week. Okay, do we have the equipment? Okay, all the servers came in the next week. Okay, now what's going on? All right, we're still waiting on the routers and the switches. Okay, we got everything. Um, we, we're we ready to install. Now they're going to go talk to the um, IT department, the system administrators who do Red Hat. And they're going to say, okay, how long is it going to take you guys to install? What First of all, what do you guys need to do? And then the, the system administrator is going to say, okay, it's going to be broken down on the four parts. The first part is um, we have to put this stuff in racks. That's going to, and then the project managers will go, how long is that going to take? It's going to take us two days to do that because we got 20 different pieces of equipment. Okay. Now, what's the next piece? All right. After we rack it, we've got to put all the, uh, configure it and put all the passwords in, whatever. And then we've got to put the network, uh, the network, uh, IPs in, we got to go get the network. Uh, how long is that all each one of those things going to take? So the, the project manager is going to put each one of those things in. They're going to say, okay, first we got to put this, we're going to, they're going to rack the systems. That's going to take two days. Then they've got to configure all the IPs on it. That's going to take three days. And then they've got to get the IP addresses from this other department. That usually takes a week. Now that we have the IP addresses, we got to put all the network uh, subnets in, and then we got to test it. All of this stuff's going to take us three months to do. All the systems set up. Once all that stuff's done, then they go to the next department. So you kind of get the idea. They don't have to know how to do the finances for the system when they're talking to the acquisition department. They don't have to know the IT part. They don't have to know how to install Red Hat. They just need to know. They need to talk to the Red Hat guys and then get a breakdown of all the things they need to do. They don't need to know my piece, which is cybersecurity. They just need to work with us and know the tools to actually map all this stuff and know what the what's called dependencies are. Because if my part of cybersecurity is dependent on this other person's getting done, then they have to put all of this stuff in the spreadsheet or into some kind of a database or something. That's why uh, project managers don't have to really know technology. Uh, let me see, I got some other questions here. Are there some positions that are not required, that don't require a, a clearance? Yes. Yeah, there's 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 a uh, quite a few cybersecurity is if you're talking about cybersecurity. Yes. Um, so not all cybersecurity uh, requires a um, requires a clearance. So, for example, the last job I was in didn't require I was working for Verizon and they didn't require a clearance. So I did have to have a public trust, which is not a clearance. A public trust is like a it's like a background check. That makes sure that you don't have any major criminal activity. Like you don't want somebody who was a bank robber working for a bank. You know what I mean? Like a bank's not going to want somebody who robbed four different banks and was been in prison for robbing banks. You know, what I mean? you know does that make sense? So there's a background check that's required for a public trust. But yes, there are positions. It's a, it's a, it is a misconception that all cybersecurity jobs have to have a security clearance security it's security clearance it shouldn't be called a security clearance because it's a it's a clearance but it's not necessarily just security so a security clearance and cybersecurity are two different things uh, let me see another question is it is is perfect for introverts can literally sit with your earbuds on, do your job and be left alone. Yeah, true. Depends on the position. Absolutely true. Um, all the government jobs that I have have had have had to have a clearance. Government jobs. That's a great point. So most government jobs are going to have some sort of a clearance. But like I said, I've had jobs where I just had a public trust working for the government and I didn't have a clearance. Public trust is not a clearance. Like it's lumped into 
security secret clearances or whatever, but it's not actually a clearance. You do have to have a background check for it. Should I learn this skill? Yes. Public speaking is a skill. Yes, it is. I'm thinking of what to use my 9-11. Oh, let me see. Um, let me see. Wow, I'm getting a lot of messages on, on TikTok. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, more questions here. Um, getting a clearance. Getting a clearance, they really do check everything. Yeah, they, they absolutely check everything. Depending on the level of clearance, uh, they, it goes it can go pretty deep. Uh, let me see here. What are your thoughts on WGU? I think it's an awesome, it's an awesome school with great opportunities. If you can go to school, really any accredited college, if you can go to any accredited college, I would recommend it for IT. Um, I know people are crapping all over college and universities and degrees and stuff, but to be honest, like it's just more money. Like if you want more money, then get a degree. You know, if you can't afford it, then get a certification. Get, but if you can't get both certification, get. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a new word. Both of them. Both of them. If you can get both of them. Okay, let me see here. A plus was a waste. Not for me. How do you feel about Google IT support certificate? I I don't have the Google IT support certificate. Um, I per I don't have it. But a lot of people have been contacting me, telling me that they are making money off of it. I was crapping all over it in the beginning, but so many people contacted me saying, yeah, I have it. Uh, a friend of mine has it. They're making money. I'm like, are they making 100000 No, they're not making 100000 not with no experience. But So it seems like it's a good entry-level certification, but that's from me, that's from hearsay of people telling me. Uh, how about the CIS Plus? What is CIS plus? CI, let me see what that is. CIS plus, I'm curious. I don't even know what that is. CIS plus, is this a certification? Cert, certification? Anybody know what the CIS plus is? Do you mean the CYSA plus? I don't know what the CIA plus is. CIS plus is. Um, I had a really good question. Let me see. Somebody said security plus first. Okay. 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 This is a good one. Somebody said A plus is a waste. Okay. Let me explain why it's not a waste. With facts and data. No offense, this is not me attacking anybody. I just want to show you guys why it's not a waste. Okay, so first of all, let me introduce you to a form that many different government agencies use. It is called the 8140. I've talked about this many times on my channel. <clears throat> 8140 is a, is a um, federal, uh, it's a document created by the Department of Defense that's been adopted by many different federal organizations. And I'll explain to you why it doesn't just pertain to the federal government in a second. But first I want to show you, introduce you to the uh, to the 8140. So this is 8140 on SANS. So SANS is a major, it's a major cyber security organization. Um, used by, if you have been doing this for any amount of time, IT for any amount of time, you've heard of SANS. Um, they, they're one of the premier places to get best practices, best security practices. And they are talking about the 8140 on, on their site. So this is all 8140 stuff. And they're listening to all their certifications. They're saying, hey, look, guys, we, we're, a, we're 8140 compliant. Look at this, you know, because they know that this gets sales. Now, what does this have to do with the A plus? I'm gonna, I'm about to show you in a second here. I'm gonna go to 8140. Wait, sorry about that. 
80, 81, if I can type, damn, 8140 certification chart. That's what I'm looking for right there. I'm looking for the certification chart. Okay, I'm just going to go to images real quick. It's the fastest way. They change this from time to time, by the way. It's been updated. But what do you see right there on the top? On the top, A plus certification for an IAT level one. Now, is Security Plus better? Absolutely, it is. See, it's an IAT level two. So, IAT level one means information assurance technical level one. So, this is like help desk. This is like a troubleshooting, cus customer service, technical customer service. They put this on the same level as CCNA plus. You, you, CCNA security is a hard certification. Now, they did list network security, and network plus on here. I disagree with this. I don't think that this should be on there. Uh, it's not very marketable, even though it's listed. But A plus, I'm going to show you some more data. A plus. Now, it's listed here on a prominent government document. But let me show you something else. If we go to Indeed.com. I'm going to show you that it's actually marketable. This was my first certification. Um, if this is your first time in this field, um, it's not bad. CompTIA uh, A+. It's an entry-level certification. It's great to, for learning. CompTIA a plus. Let's see. Technical specialist two. Let's see if it's listed here. It's only look when you first start out, you're not going to make a crap load of money. OK, I mean, you're going to start off like this. If you're starting off, a plus certification is not bad. You want to get your foot in the door with an A plus certification. There it is right there. It's marketable. They're, they're looking for this, this certification. Is a is security plus better? Absolutely. If you can do the security plus, security plus is way better than an A plus certification. It's one of the best certifications on CompTIA. I arguably the best because it's just everybody knows what it is. It's just so marketable. There's so many jobs for a security plus. And actually, let me see. Um, let's type in CompTIA A. See, entry level. It's an entry level certification. Great for a first start. Security Plus. See how many jobs are out there for this one. Yeah, I mean, it's just a hot certification. I mean, it's just fire. A lot of people. What this means is many employers, many technical recruiters and employers are looking for somebody with a Security Plus. That's what this that's what that means. As a matter of fact, there's seven uh, sixty seven thousand jobs looking for an A plus. It's fire. This is a great certification, whereas A plus not as marketable. Not as marketable, only nine thousand jobs looking for this one. Whoops, I just gave away my whole email address there. But uh, yeah, so not not as marketable as you can see. It's only nine thousand jobs, but that's still something. If you're just starting off and you don't, you know, you can't get the Security Plus just yet, I would still say it was my first certification. Um, there are jobs for it out there. I can't say the same for a Network Plus, but um, but uh, CompTIA A Plus, yeah. If it's your first certification, if you're just starting out, yeah, I would go for it. Uh, let me see. Somebody asked me, um, would you say joining the Air Force to start your cybersecurity career is a good idea? I'm 21 and I'm doing exactly that. Um, so I was about the same age when I went into the Air Force and um, story time. Uh, is it a good choice? Well, I could tell you this. I'm not telling my kids to go to the Air Force. <laughs> um, they don't. The reason why, if they could, I, you know, it's it's a great career choice. 
it it launched my whole. I owe a lot to the military. First of all, before I shit on the military, <laughs> I owe a lot to the military. Um, I uh, was proficient in two or three different uh, careers I could have taken once I got out. I mean, um, I the benefits are amazing. It's unmatched to this day. I've been out of the military for almost 20 years now, and the the benefit, nothing I've done can even come close to the U.S. military's benefits. Um, you, you pay attention to it. I know you're going to be like, they're going to drill it in your head, all the benefits, but I'm telling you, it's life-changing. Um, take advantage of as many benefits as you can. If you do use it, um, uh, I've gotten a, I got two degrees from the military. I got my certifications. I went in with no, I was a high school dropout. My, my, I know it doesn't look like it, but the, the back, my background, you would not believe how hard it was. And I didn't sit here and tell you how, what I went through, but I'm just going to tell you, like, I was a high school dropout. I was exposed to the worst 1980s drug infested streets i can't even like it was so bad it, you would not believe how bad it was so i went into the military i got two degrees i got three certifications when i got out i had uh experience uh doing um it i had three years of experience doing it networking firewalls uh troubleshooting servers troubleshooting uh laptops trouble like i i knew what i was doing when i got out i knew unix linux i knew uh word i mean microsoft i knew when i got out i had a hands-on experience doing all that stuff uh and then they have all these benefits that they'll teach you all about so and I traveled to like 14 different countries, something like that. So was it was it good? Yes. It changed the whole. Tra I don't know that if I hadn't gone to the military, I don't, I don't know that I just didn't have the support. I had to do it. I had, I did not have a choice. I had a choice, but the choice was the streets. <laughs> the choice was the streets. Um, so I chose the military and it changed my life. That being said. That being said, <laughs> I went to two different war zones. My life was in peril more than once. Uh, it showed me a side of humanity that I had. Most people just see it on TV. Like I experienced it firsthand. And um, as when I was your age and um, I don't know, man, I, I don't know what to say. Like it's, it was hard. I would, I would not like, I don't tell my kids to go in the military. I'd rather them. I, I got their back. I'm just going to help them out. You know what I mean? Like it was now granted, you know, God willing, there'll be no wars or anything. But when I was in, there was two, there was, there was multiple wars when I was in, I went to two. So and um, I really can't complain. I mean, I was in the Air Force and saw a couple combat zones. I knew Marines and, and Army guys who he, that they that's all they knew was combat zones. So I was I was really blessed, you know, in that I didn't see as much action as that they as they did. And some of those guys came back really messed up, man. So what I would say is, if you're going, yeah, yes, it's a good idea for a career. It's 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 really good um, for your career. Um, just make sure you get something out of it. You know, don't some of the some guys go in and they don't get the military takes more out of them than what they than what they were able to get out. And don't don't be that guy. You know, if you go in, go come out with a degree, come out with experience and something you want to do on the outside. And the Air Force gives you that opportunity. But if cross train like I was I was a I went in as a cop because my ASVAB scores were too low. I had to retake the ASVAB and then cross train 
into something I wanted, which was computers. And I was able to do that. And the Air Force allows you to do that. So take advantage, take full advantage because they're going to take full advantage of you. So make sure you, when you get out, you take full advantage of, because they are going to, I mean, my, my body is destroyed because the military. <laughs> All right. Let me see. We've got any more questions here. A plus is a waste. I disagree. Agree to disagree. Uh, let me see. Rhodes says, um, I'm going for an AS two years through, like you said, uh, before certifications are quick, quicker, and I'm using my GI Bill. Awesome. That's awesome. Yep. A, uh, Associates is awesome. Um, any th thoughts on, I don't know what the CIS plus is. What is the best large companies or government use large companies and government use Oracle? Okay. I don't know what's it all depends on what people like. Okay. Most government workers are retired, will retire on Friday and be a contractor on Monday doing the same job for more money. That's true. Um, who here is currently working in IT? There's a lot of people here working in IT. Uh, do you think that there is a demand for all positions or only certain ones? Uh, there's a huge demand. I can only speak to what I what I know. Um, I could tell you there's a huge demand for cybersecurity. Um, cybersecurity is huge, especially for critical struct. Uh, critical industries like the government, um, um, critical infrastructure, um, state and federal governments. Uh, there's a huge demand right now. Like we can't get enough people. Like everybody wants to work for um, FANG, which is Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And there's a couple other ones, Twitter. Because those guys pay a lot, they pay like two hundred thousand. Like they pay like literally like two hundred k, you know, for very little experience. But the problem is that they're right now. You can, as you can see, they're volatile because they are moving with the direction of the of the uh, recession. Like they're not recession proof. That's the problem with them. But cybersecurity is, and government is recession proof. So. Um, look for critical infrastructure. Um, another one is like um, companies like Verizon and T-Mobile and Comcast and all like critical infrastructure type organizations. You know your utilities, your 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 gas, your water, your you know those places are really looking for people, especially in cybersecurity, because people just don't know about these jobs. I think people just don't know about these jobs personally. And then also there there is a, a bit of a bar that you have to you have to come in knowing some stuff. But now they're so desperate. They're bringing in people off the street who know nothing, who are willing to learn. Right. If you go to Google and type in cybersecurity apprentice, you'll see jobs that they'll take you knowing nothing and then teach you. Now, you have to know something. You have to know I.T. stuff. OK, they're they're going to expect you to know basic I.T. stuff. But that's what the CompTIA A plus certifications like that is for. I used it to learn like I I used it to like if the the breakdown of CompTIA A plus the reason why I like it so much is because they're teaching the fundamentals of what you need to know to do IT basic fundamentals of what you need to know. OK, let me see. Somebody said on YouTube. <clears throat> oh, Facebook. Holy crap. I got a Facebook comment. Wow. Um, said uh, Bruce. Your book too is out of print on Amazon. Will you, uh, yeah, I I took it out of print because I saw some mistakes on it, so I took it off. <laughs> um, I, I've got to I've got to fix some stuff on that thing. So uh, what it will happen was I'm getting it. I'm going to have an audio book, but my 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 guy Frank, who reads the audio books, 
He's like, hey, there's some mistakes here. I'm like, okay. So I yanked it down. So if you guys are interested, might as well do some advertisement here. Pay some bills. If you're interested, if you go to Amazon and type in uh, cybersecurity jobs, you'll see I've got a book of three jobs out there, uh, books out there. Oh, man, I'm freaking getting tired. I'm going to get off this thing soon. But here's uh, my three books. If you're interested, this is talking about how to get into cybersecurity jobs, how to market your resume, how to the second book is talking about like the different categories of cybersecurity stuff. I talk about every week about it's not just hacking. There's other categories. And I'm telling you, like how to navigate those categories. And then, of course, I've got one for work from home, like everything that I'm doing, I'm teaching you how to do in these books. I also have a course on all of this stuff. But if you if let's say I'm trying to help so that if you have if you're on a budget, you just can't afford it. Um, there is a free there's a free option too. you can literally go to my site and I have a my literal resume. You can download it right now on, on convocourses.com. Download the resume and that will tell you a lot of the stuff that you need to know if you just want to try it for yourself. Um, there it is. For free, and also you can go to YouTube. I got tons of training, free stuff on YouTube that you can just watch my videos for free. You got to sort through them, you got to find all the videos and everything, but they're there. Now, if you can afford it, there's some books here. These these books right here are only you know 19 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever. Um, and I'm releasing these part by part, and at some point I'll put them all together as a series. But I also have these that are going to be um, they're going to be audio books and a couple of them. One of them already is an audio book. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about risk management framework, ISO stuff or you happen to be in IT already, this is perfect for you. If you want to learn how to be an information system security officer and get into GRC type stuff, this is walking you through it from a layman's term. It's using layman's terms, which is something that I wish that uh, the federal government would do a little bit more put it in terms that make sense and so that's what i've done if you're interested there it is right there uh but also like a lot of stuff that i teach is like i'm literally telling you guys how to, how to do this stuff every week if you join me here if you have any questions right now I'll, I'll answer your question like stuff that's in the book i'm literally i'm literally telling you step by step what's in my book but if you if you're serious then yeah Spend some money, invest in yourself. Uh, let me see. Let me see. I've got some other questions here. Do you think it would be worth it to go back to college? Yeah, you know what? Like, honestly, um, yes. If you if you're trying to get into IT, okay, let me just I'm just gonna put this all in, in context for you. I am, let me just tell you, I am a high school dropout. OK, I. The smartest people I know did not go to college. The first the first people that I met who were my mentors, who were some of the most to this day, the most brilliant people I ever met didn't have. I had a degree, I had two degrees and certifications and I went to them and they had no none of that. All they had is experience, but they were smart as hell. <laughs> and um, they were the, all, always the smartest guys in the room. And. Um, those freaking guys taught me a lot of stuff that I know now. I mean, a lot like their their whole way of thinking was what was fascinating to me. Not just what they knew, but what the way they thought was amazing. That being said, they do have a degree now because they realized the the value of it. It's really a degree is about money. Like it's about you competing against other people in the market. The first thing you need to do is know that it's no IT stuff. If you're trying to get into cybersecurity, the first thing you have to know is the fundamentals. The fundamentals is taught in CompTIA A+. If you don't have enough money to get a degree, just go through the lessons. You can literally just go to the go to Barnes & Noble, go to the library and learn, get an A+ book and just learn it. You don't even have to get the certification, just learn the stuff in the book. Or you can go, if you can just go straight for Security Plus. Learn A+. You got to learn. Here's the basic things that you need to know. You need to know how computers work. How does the RAM work with the CPU, work with the storage? And what are those those three different things? How do they work? 
The reason why from a security cybersecurity perspective that you need to know that is because a lot of times malware and attackers, they go after those those critical pieces. They go after those things. So you have to know, understand like what the functions of them are and how they work. You got to learn, learn networking, Net, networking, WANs, LANs, local area networks, wide area networks. What's the difference between them? What are the types of topologies that you have with networking? Because from a security perspective, you've got to sometimes segregate different networks so that maybe you have critical information on this network. How do you separate it from this other network? What are some techniques that you can use? So you got to look know what like a VLAN is and what a public address is versus a private address. You have to know those basic things. Another thing is the diff how software works with hardware. You don't necessarily even have to code. You don't have to, it's not even that deep. You don't even have to go that deep. You know, when I got my first job making uh got out of the military, I didn't know how to code when I got out of the military and I got a job making like 45. With our travel, it was more like 70 because every time we would travel to all these different countries, we were getting overtime. We were making like 70. And um, I didn't know how to code. My my partner, he knew how to do some scripting, but I didn't know how to code. I was making 70K. You know, I, any coding I learned was on my own. I learned coding on my own just because I was trying to get an app. I was trying to make a million dollars off an app. I was like, oh, I got to learn how to do this. I didn't make a million dollars off the app newsflash, you know, <laughs> it's like uh, anyway. So, yeah, you don't have to know how to code, but you know how to, you have to learn how uh, software works with hardware, I would say. Um, so those in the cloud technology, you need to know that. So the heart, the the hardware, the software, how computers work, um, networking basic security stuff they're going to teach you all that stuff is in a plus and that's why i say it's a really good learning tool if you don't want to go to school should you go to school if you have the capacity if you can do it if you have the resources to do it the money yes absolutely because all it's going to do is make you more valuable to employers and and like instead of making 70k 60k you you can make upwards of 100k or more so Um, let me see. I do not have a degree. I have many certifications and I built experience. Yep. You don't need one, but you, uh, let me see. Somebody said, my suggestion is don't get caught up in titles. Focus on the requirements of the position. Absolutely. This man knows what he's talking about. Uh, public trust is different, mostly for public private sector. And state jobs. Yes, that's true. But um, when I work with NASA, they actually had me do a, pri a public trust, pub a public trust level six. So some some federal organizations do take a uh, public trust only. So like uh, probably help me out here, guys. Um, I've been working with other uh, federal organizations, and instead of doing, they don't need a top secret clearance. They don't need you to have a secret clearance. They only need you to have a public trust. So outside of the Department of Defense, outside the intelligence agencies, um, a lot of the other federal organizations, they just need a, a public trust. So public trust is, I, I had no idea because I've been working nothing but DOD for years until I started breaking away and doing private sector and working for um, uh, the private sector and working for different parts of the the U.S. government. So, and they all, it's like public trust stuff. It's not like, it's not clearances. What part of the country are you located? Colorado, Midwest. Uh, would you say it would be a good choice to join the Air Force to start your cybersecurity career? Absolutely. We just talked about this, but yeah, I would say it it's a great choice um if you can handle it uh the the air force any <sighs> the air force but also <laughs> okay okay any branch of the military is 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 a good choice because they they're really good at um they're really good at teaching you not only the fundamentals but the the hands-on portion of cybersecurity. i got so much experience from being in the military, if you should have, I would say, put it to you like this. There's a lot at stake when you go into the military because you could go to a war zone. They're preparing you to go to war. 
Like you could literally be on the front lines of somewhere of some conflict that other people ignore on their uh, on TV that you're going to have to go there and be on the front lines. And I'm telling you, it is not fun. It is not fun. Uh, and anybody who says it's fun, they're either crazy, they're psychotic, or they just don't know they're lying. They just don't know what the hell they're talking about. It's not fun. So uh, go if you do go into the military, go for more than just a degree. Go to travel the world. Have more than one reason. You know, for me, I went in because I wanted to... I wanted to get a degree. I wanted to get a career. I wanted to travel. You know, I, I, I like have more than one reason to go in. Um, but yeah, it's a great, it's one of the best ways to learn about cybersecurity if you go in as a cybersecurity person. Now, don't don't go in and, and get them to trick you into doing some stuff you don't want to do. Don't do that. <laughs> Because they will, those recruiters will try to trick you into going in and doing some. They'll say, oh, security forces is security, basically. You know, they'll say stuff like that. It's totally different. You know, <laughs> those freaking recruiters, man, they have some lying. Okay. What do you know about container scanning? I'm not sure. Do you mean cloud computing? I'm not sure. Somebody on this call might be able to answer that one. Does anybody here know about container scanning? Is that cloud computing? Uh, it sounds like cloud cloud computing, but is it virtual networks? I'm not I'm not sure. Um, at my last AWS, ah yes, okay. Um, I at my last position, we would do that. We would do um, we had a service where we would do risk analysis on containers, so we would scan a uh, an instance of a network or a system that was cloud-based. And then we would get this, I would just get the results back. And for me, it looked just like a regular network. So me not knowing cloud stuff, I just, I just rereading it just like a normal, you know, <laughs> the only difference what that I saw was that instead of IPs, sometimes it would have like the agent number or something, some uh, like a, an agent number that identified the that container but i was looking at the same types of vulnerabilities so for me it was the same like it was it would be the same if i was looking at um, a dmz system versus a internal system or whatever wherever they happen to put it so i would in the context of where it was in the organization is what i was looking at so i can't i can't go into great detail about cloud computing you know, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm just not there yet. <laughs> okay, let me see here. I got some other questions. Um, uh, let me see. Man, I got a lot of 83 new messages. Oh, my Lord. Um, the Air Force is big on education. Uh, the people I work for all have PhDs. Yeah, Air, I would say Air Force. I can't speak for the other branches. Um, I did meet some really smart dudes in the Army, in the in the in the Marines, like, but they were all like really specialized. Like in the Army, the guys who were really really specialized were like the um, what are they called? Oh my gosh, they weren't officers, warrant officers, warrant, warrant officers were really sharp and they had all these sand certifications. Those guys were really, I was really blown away by them. Their level of knowledge, their level of dedication, they were on a whole different level. Uh, and then the other specialization, the Marines, they would have like one dude. The Marines were like the smartest dudes, but there weren't many of them. Like there'd be one dude who they would have do everything. And that one dude knew everything. <laughs> he could do DNS stuff. He could, he was a master at scanning. He was like a cybersecurity guy. He would, there's not many Marines. So they, so whenever it seems like what would happen is they would have one dude or two dudes do everything. And so when that guy got out of the Marines, that dude knew everything, but there weren't many of them. So, but in the Air Force, you know, we have a whole career field and all of us have to do that stuff. So there were more of us technical people. I was just seemed like 
because I worked with the Marines, the Army, you know, the only ones I didn't work with was really uh, the Coast Guard. I never really worked with them. But the Navy, all those guys had like these guys who were really smart, really sharp. But there was there weren't many of them. And then the Air Force had like more like average level skill set. So you had a better if you go into the military Air Force, you have a better chance, in my opinion. Uh, you have a better chance of getting a more well-rounded experience uh, because they had us doing the work. You know, you, you're not going to be that one dude who th- you can drop behind the lines and, and do a network from scratch. You know, you're not going to be Mac- MacGyver, but you're going <laughs> to like the Army guys and the the Marines guys have one dude who's like a freaking a genius who could do everything. But we were like average technical dudes who were pretty well-rounded uh let me see more questions more question somebody said it's more of an intense background check oh, okay i think that was already answered a plus may not be a waste for others but basic knowledge for me yeah I don't know lower uh, lower positions. I go for the money. So it yeah, A plus. What I will say is A plus is very basic. Uh, it's very basic knowledge. If you're if you're coming in uh, from scratch, it's very basic. However, uh, if you're if you can, if there's a way for you to do it, I would I would recommend doing Security Plus, getting AWS. Uh, certification and um the reason why is because cloud cloud pays really well the security plus is highly marketable a plus is for beginners like if you are coming in and you're trying to get your foot in the door at a at a place then get the a plus certification get your foot in the door go work a menial job for about six months four months whatever and then you have experience put that on your resume boom market yourself but another thing you can do is is uh like chris the cybersecurity chris guy did here where he went to wgu if you can afford it he got a master's degree in like six months or something like either bachelor's or a ma- something ridiculous within a year this dude was making a hundred thousand within one year unheard of so wow thanks for those hearts i appreciate that so within one year you can if you have the if you have the capacity if you have the money to do it if you if you can do it i would go for a bachelor's degree at something someplace like wgu and then take your bachelor's degree while you're getting a bachelor's degree get some experience by working at the school if you can and then get a certification that's the way you get that bag but if you don't have that experience then um did you take you long to get the comp to a plus it was my first certification and i went to a boot camp and i don't recommend going to boot. you don't have to do a boot camp the military paid for it for me uh i don't recommend doing a boot camp on you they're like ten thousand dollars do a boot camp or something if you're gonna spend ten thousand dollars on on education um uh, spend it on a degree. Don't spend it on a certification. I don't recommend boot camps. But yeah, I for me, uh, did it take a long time? No, it didn't. But I am a psychopath when it comes to these. <laughs> At the time, I was crazy. All I studied it. Any chance I got, I was studying for the A plus certification. I was a maniac. So for me, it took. Oh, it took a few months. It took about two, three months, I think. Two, three months. But that was like, I had no, that was my first certification. So, uh, CCNA security should be removed because they uh, don't have that cert anymore. (laughs) Oh, man, I didn't know that. (laughs) Uh, Let me see. I'm taking the CY... S A plus beta exam tomorrow morning. Oh, congr- good luck. Good luck to you. That's a good cert. Anything cloud is hot. I agree. Um, I'm in a boot camp for security plus. 
um, take full advantage of it. I mean, at the end, normally um, pay attention to the end, especially. That's all I'll say about that. So boot camps are if <sighs> boot camps, if you can get in one, if you have the resources to do it for me, somebody paid for it. Uh, it's great. But if if you have 10K in your pocket and you, you have a boot camp over here and you have a degree over here, put the 10K in the degree. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. You know, if you had two choices between those two things, that's what I my personal opinion about boot camps. Are they good? Some boot camps are are awesome. So uh, but if you had 10K, your money will be better spent on a certain on a degree. My personal opinion. Um, Can you start in can you start in cloud? Yeah, absolutely. Go to uh, like this other person said. Uh, AWS Cloud is a great place to start. AWS Cloud um, practitioner, yeah, that's the one to get because they right now. The reason why I say that is because the Amazon owns most the most of the market share for the cloud. Like federal government, they go to AD, They're going to either Microsoft Azure or Amazon, mostly Amazon. Amazon, I think, controls like something like thirty percent of the entire market share for cloud and the compete, the, the highest competition is between AWS, Microsoft, and I'm, I'm forgetting one, but Google's on that list. Those are the top, I believe those are the top three, if I'm not mistaken, but there's other players, there's uh, Oracle's in there and um, a few other open source ones and, uh, and stuff. But the top three is AWS, Microsoft, Google are the top cloud providers right now. So if you want to get a certification, I would get it in those. There's other, CompTIA has a sort of cloud certification. Uh, who else? Um, Google has a cloud certification, AWS, uh, Azure, CompTIA, Oracle, essentially all the top players have some sort of certification, but the top ones are AWS and and, and Microsoft Azure for sure. Uh, ISC2 Squared also has a cloud certification. I have an MBA in cybersecurity. That's awesome. With an emphasis on cybersecurity. That's all. That's incredible. It's great. Um, I do Oracle mixed Azure. That's awesome. January, I'm taking the AWS Cloud Certification Practitioner. Man, congrats. I, I don't even have that one yet. But I've been, I really want to take that one. I'm studying for my AWS Solutions Architect Cloud Certification. That's awesome. Uh, are you more interested in the design side or sales side? Uh, oh, talking to somebody else. Okay, let me see. Uh, let me see here. So many questions. I got so many questions on TikTok. So I'm just it's like 80, 90 out of, for whatever reason, I, I got this rush of people in there. So I'm just going through answering questions. If you're in the Air Force, make sure you take care of the, you take advantage of the bridge program. Uh, well, I'm way behind on messages. All right. All right. Uh, let me see. Um, let me just go down to the bottom real quick. What boot camps do you recommend? I'm a social worker. Um, you're a social, I'm assuming you're a social worker trying to get into IT. And if you were to take a boot camp, which one do I recommend? I don't have any in particular I would recommend. Um, the, probably the hottest market if you don't know anything about IT, you got to do basic IT first is what I would recommend. I don't I wouldn't even recommend a boot camp to begin with. I would recommend you, excuse me, hit the books and learn basic IT stuff first is what I would recommend. Like on your own, like learn it on your take a book, 
and study it for yourself first. Um, and then after, so if I was starting, if I was a social worker, I'm a, so let's say I'm a social worker and I want to get into IT, what would I do? Knowing everything I know now, if I could go back, if I had to go back, what would I do as a social worker? So knowing what I know now, first, I'd have to know the basic IT stuff. So I would either use to just to learn basic IT and learn it, right? Not necessarily for money right away. I would do either A plus certification or Google support IT to learn the basic IT stuff. That's it. Because the breakdown of now, if I had the capacity and I had the money and the resources and the time frame to do it, college, university, uh, WGU, that would be the best choice. But if I didn't and I couldn't get that master's degree or bachelor's degree, and I, I didn't have the time or resources to do it, then I would go for certification. I would do the A plus certification just to learn. Maybe take the cert. You don't have to take it, but all you're doing is just going through the common body of knowledge that you need to pass the certification. So that's what I would do first. Then I would go, I would specialize in cloud. That's what I would do. I specialize in cloud. I would do uh, the AWS cloud, uh, the AWS cloud practitioner. Fairly easy. It's cheap. It'll let me know if that's where I want to continue to go in that direction. And and I'm specialized in something. And a lot of people are looking for somebody who is specialized in cloud. And there's just not a lot of people doing it right now, especially critical infrastructure. So you're going to get paid out the gate for cloud technology for that level of knowledge. So that's what I would do. And then I would specialize in cloud security because there's a cloud uh, I believe you have to go through like an intermediate cloud certification and then there's a specialization for cloud. So that's what I, if knowing what I know, you could probably get very close to six figures just doing that with almost no experience because it, now you'd have to know it. Like you can't, you wouldn't be able to walk in off the street and not know nothing, but you can do, you can get into cybersecurity with no little or no experience, but you can't come in with no knowledge. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Network Plus, Security Plus, AZ900. That's the cert path I'm planning to go. Um, Network Plus. Okay, so let me break down your path. Let me break down your path because I have some of your certifications. <laughs> so Network Plus, number one, is good for learning basic network security stuff. Basic network stuff, not even security, just basic networking is not very useful for marketability. I'm just being honest with you. I have I have the network plus. It is my most how can I put this tactfully? I was gonna say what I want to say is it's the most useless certification that I have. <laughs> but I don't want to say that. What I want to say is it's not very marketable, but it's great for learning for beginning learners. Security plus is fire. Security plus is fire. It's very marketable. Everybody knows what it is. Once you get it, uh, you can put that on your resume and then you're you're good. Um, AZ900 is a great certification for cloud Azure. Uh, great certification. If I'm not mistaken, that's what it is, right? AZ900. Yeah, that's Azure Cloud, I believe. So that's um, that's a really good certification path, actually. But I'm just trying to tell you, Network Plus isn't going to be marketable, but it's great for learning network stuff which cloud certification do you recommend like where should i get them okay all right let's go to the internet here so let me show you my my screen so i'm assuming that if you're going for cloud stuff you have a you already have a basic knowledge of it stuff and you're just going directly for cloud OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go. I'm on Google. I'm going to type in um, AWS certification. You want to follow along. That's what I typed right there. AWS certification. 
And uh, actually, let me share my screen over here. AWS certification, right? Skip all these ads. Skip all these ads. Uh, and you want to go here. AWS from is Amazon. It's an Amazon cloud certification. Here it is right here. You've got schedule exam, practice exam. You want to go to there. They've got like a breakdown of the fundamentals. But before I go there, let me just show you like what I meant by their uh, a path here. So this is for beginners. And they kind of tell you what they expect you, what you're going to learn, you know, where you're going to go. And then they also tell you like what you need to know before you even start this. But it's just foundational. No prior experience needed. So some certifications require that you come in with experience, like two, three years of experience. So that's the great thing about this one right here. That's why I recommend it. Now, they're, they're not saying you don't you can't you don't know any IT whatsoever. They're just saying, you know, you, you do need to know some IT stuff. Um, and from here. You got these associates and I, I don't know which one I which one I would take here. Depends on what path you're going to go. But um, at some point, let me see, which one would you take next? Professional, I'm sorry. So you would go from here to here, from here to here. And you guys who are, are watching this, correct me if I'm wrong. Once I got one of these, you can get a specialization. And I would do security. This is your goal right here. And then on this site, they actually have online training, if I'm not mistaken. Let me go back. There is a certification path for this. AWS certification path. Let me just, I don't want to steer you wrong here. There's a certification path that I've seen before. Uh, uh, here it is right here. Is this it? Yeah, here we go right here. Check this out. So you'll start here, cloud practitioner. Okay, I was right the first time. Associate, you'll go to an associate, either developer. You don't have to do all of these. You'll take one of these paths. But one of them is going to lead you to these specializations. Or once you get to a certain level, then you want to specialize in security. Is what I would recommend. But maybe you get this far and you're like, nah, I want to do databases. Or I want to do data analytics or whatever. But you want to have some sort of specialty because uh, one, some a wise person once told me when I first got into this field, they said that you want to specialize. Um, and he was absolutely right. So that dude, I was in the air. I was active duty at the time. I was thinking about getting out. And I asked his advice. He was a contractor. And he'd been doing contracting work for like 15 years. And I said, what I'm about to get out. Like, what do you recommend I do? And he said, whatever you do, just specialize. And I said, well, what should I specialize in? He said, it doesn't matter. Just specialize in something. Don't be just a generalist because they don't make as much money. He was absolutely right. Specialize, find something and then specialize in it. And make, you can make cloud your specialty. Cloud security. Let me see. Wow, there's some there's some really sharp people on here uh, that are helping people out. That's really that's really great, guys. I really that's that's awesome. Uh, that's really what's great about these doing these lives. Uh, Cisco is big is great, but I rec but I remember it's specialized. However, it's a great foundation. There's so many, this I have so many comments. There's no way I'm going to be able to answer all these comments. God, man, this is amazing. Wow. Do you recommend data analytics? Okay. I'm going to be real with you. I don't know much about data analytics, but what I learned uh, for writing my book, um, I wrote a book and part of, part of it, um, part of security, the, one of the security control, um, categories that I addressed, it addressed data analytics. 
So I had to do a little bit of research about it. And um, what I learned was that data analytics has a has a bunch of certs. You don't even have to have a cert for data analytics. That was what was amazing about it. And Google has some kind of a data analytics. Um, let me see if I can show you what I'm talking about here. Google has a data analytics um, course. There's a bunch of courses online, and then there's a whole or there's a whole uh, market that's looking for data analytics. So that is actually awesome. I don't know how much these guys make. But let's see. Salary. That's not bad. That's not bad. And that's for my area. So my area is a little bit lower than the rest of the U.S. So Glassdoor. That's a pretty fairly recent data on this. That's a data analytics person. What I did learn about data analyst is that because um, I was curious about like what's the difference between a data analytics person and a database administrator. And um, what I read was that so a database administrator, they're managing the data on a database. They are maybe making creating users on a database, um, dropping tables on a database, adding tables in the database, de adding data, taking data out, putting it in. That's what I mean. Sets of data, uh, make, you know, making sure, maintaining the actual infrastructure of the database, the hardware, the software, all that kind of stuff, doing SQL, doing queries, things like that. A data uh, analyst, they're not working with the database normally. They're not working with the hardware and software of the database. What they're doing is they're taking large sets of information and, and putting it into like reports. So they might be using Excel spreadsheets or something. They're not necessarily using, using a database. They can use anything from, uh, from um, Excel spreadsheets that has a whole bunch of numbers in it. And then they're gonna make like charts and pie charts and stuff that's presentable to the organization. So they might have to present those, those uh, reports and um, queries to a C-level exec or to business managers or whatever, but they're taking different sets of data and kind of making the data look pretty and, and, and making it so that it's, it's that, that business decision makers can make a, they can look at the data from a bird's eye view and get more information off of it. If that makes any sense. So that's what, that's all I know about would I would I recommend it? Ab absolutely. If that's something you want to do, yeah, I would I would recommend it. I mean, it makes a pretty good chunk of change. It didn't. I didn't see that you have to necessarily have a degree, which I always think is a good thing. Um, it's you could you can get away with just having the skills to do it, like having maybe a cert and a and a real good at what you do and parsing the data and stuff. So yeah, I would. I would recommend if that's what you want to do. Uh, let me see here. Let me see here. I'm just kind of going through. I, I like over 100 messages. <laughs> this is crazy. This is insanity. Uh, there's a free program uh, called Data Science for All offered on correlation, and it's free. Yeah, that, that was the cool thing about data analytics that I liked is that there was a lot of free programs for it. It just seemed like an open thing where they just you could if you knew how to do it then uh, let me see. Somebody said I'm 58 and I'm just jumping into it. I love it. No age discrimination in the field. Man, if you know the information if you know the information, that's all people want to know. That's the that's the great thing that I like about cybersecurity. Is there ageism? Is there sexism? Is there racism? Absolutely. Like it's everywhere. It's pervasive. You're not going to escape it. Doesn't matter what race you are. Doesn't matter what gender. What whatever. Right? People. This it's human nature. Like we're going to hate on each other because that's who we are. Is as animals <laughs> this is a part of us unfortunately uh but when some think about it like this 
when you when your electric goes out and you're on Google looking for an electrician, electrician, are you like, man, I need a white technician to come here. I need a white male technician to turn my lights back on. No, you don't give a damn. You just want your lights back on. That's how cybersecurity is. When somebody hires you and they really need something, they just got hacked and there was a breach. They don't care if you're if you can come in here and help them to get through their breach. They their their life is on the line. Their organization, their money, their livelihood is on. They don't give a damn what color you are. They need their their stuff fixed. So yeah. Somebody said they care. That hasn't been my experience. Um, that has not been my experience. Whenever something has happened, they want that stuff fixed. And if it's a problem, it, it hasn't for me, it has not been a problem. Where the racial stuff or whatever comes in is with my peers, like the guy next to me who's competing with me. That's where it might come up. But the customer, <laughs> no, they're like, listen. This stuff is broke. When your plumbing goes out and your living room floods and you don't know what to, and then somebody shows up who doesn't have to, and think about it. You don't care. You don't care what race you don't, you're like, damn, my floor is flooding. I need to stop this. If a black dude comes in, if a white dude comes in, if it's a woman, you're like, thank God you're here. My floor is being flooded with toilet water. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? That's how it is with cybersecurity. They had a breach. Um, they know there's a problem. There's cyber, there's, there's vulnerabilities. We got to fix this. We, we have to fix this. What do we do? They don't, they don't care because livelihood money is on the line. Like you're not messing around. They don't, they do not, now they do care that you, you know, the government will care that you're, they have to care. The government will care that you're an American citizen sometimes. Like sometimes um, that because of the nature of the laws, they can't just hire, you know, somebody from another country or, or a foreign national or something because it's a, it's a security risk. So they have to hire, you know, but if they could, you better believe they'll be hiring people from India. <laughs> you better believe if they could do it, they would totally do it. Because they want stuff fixed now, yesterday. Uh, let me see. Cloud and cybersecurity are the wild, wild west. It's open and there's so many jobs. Yeah, man, it's fire right now. It's, it's on fire. It's on fire. We don't have enough people to do this work. So every time I get into a new position, and then my new job is no exception, they we're doing three or four different jobs. Um, we're doing three or four different jobs because they we don't have enough people to do this work in in the U.S. We don't have enough people doing it, and people are you know, I myself am getting burned out. How's the pay? Pay is very good in cybersecurity. Let me show you. What is the pay like in cybersecurity? Allow me to allow me to explain what the pay looks like <laughs> in cybersecurity. Switch my screen real quick. All right, so we were looking at data analyst, but let's look at cybersecurity. Cyber let's look at just a cybersecurity specialist. Cybersecurity specialist. Cyber actually just say salary cybersecurity salary cybersecurity salary it depends on what state and what your job is so architects make pretty good money um but uh let me see 85 like look at this information Security analyst. Cybersecurity is a very big field, so we got a special. We got to put something in here, like cybersecurity specialist. That's a cybersecurity specialist type jobs, and depends on the state, right? Look, Iowa, Mississippi, Alaska, 
Average, though, is about 90, 91 for a specialist. Now, let's look at ISO. That's an information system security uh, officer. Boom. Booyah. Uh, let's see. How about um, compliance officer? Compliance officer. If you are in the medical industry, this is a really good one for you because they need compliance people. 71. Um, here's a popular one. Cyber security analyst. People like typing that one in. Yeah, that's not bad. Arizona, 48 an hour yearly. Yeah, it's not it's not bad. Not a bad gig. Not a bad gig. Definitely worth their time to look at it. If you have the time, if you have the resources, if you want to get into this, definitely worth your time to to uh, to look into it. If you're trying to do some long term type stuff. Um, somebody said, can anyone learn how to do cybersecurity? Meaning you need to be good at math or coding. No, you don't. So, um, no, you don't like, that's the great thing about cybersecurity is that it's technical, but it's one, it's a field that a lot of people assume one of the misconceptions is that. You need a security clearance. You don't. Um, will they do a background check? Yes, but that doesn't mean you need a security clearance. A security clearance is separate from a cybersecurity job. Two separate things. Uh, you can have a security clearance and be a janitor service. You can have you can have a security clearance and do uh, any job, secretarial work. You know, <laughs> a security clearance is just a it's just a very comprehensive background check to see if you to allow you to have access to certain classified information. A cybersecurity job is protection is protecting the organization's information. So it's two different things. Another misconception is that you have to have you have to be a math whiz or know how to code or something. Also not true. So this, it's not true. Like I'm living proof of it. I am not good at math. You know, I'm I am not good. at. I wish I was. You know, I, I could lie to you and say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm so good at I'm not. I make over 100,000 and I'm not good at math. <laughs> I'm just not. Um, coding, I, I barely know how to code. Um, I have the patience to teach myself. I taught myself one time I had to learn which one was it, Swift? I don't know. I, I taught myself to code just to do an app. You remember when that app craze? Remember when Fla Flappy Birds? People were making a million dollars off of making one app. I I was like, you know, there's gold in them there heels. So I started learning how to code so I could get an app out. So, yeah, I mean, I know some code, but it has nothing to do with my job. Like, I, I haven't had to go to a job and know code. Like, there was a couple times when scripting would have helped me, but I never not didn't get a job. I didn't not get a job because I didn't know how to code with cybersecurity because cybersecurity is a very broad field. It's a very broad field. There are some parts of cybersecurity where you do need to code. Like if you're doing app security, probably you need to code, know how to code a little bit. Uh, if you're doing, uh, when I was in cyber, when I was a cybersecurity analyst, there was times when I needed to know um, certain scripting languages, but it wasn't like, it's not like you were writing a game. Like you had to know little bits of code of scripting. Um, there's, but what I do, compliance, none, zero. What degree do you have? Um, I have a, I have an information technology degree, a bachelor's degree in information technology. And if you're like, wow, that's amazing. Did Bruce go to Harvard? Did Bruce go to did Bruce go to Stanford University? I went to University of Phoenix, man. If you don't know what that is, just Google it. <laughs> University of Phoenix, like one of the biggest money grabbing organizations of all times. 
I learned a lot of stuff there. I mean, I don't think it's a scam or anything, but um, yeah, the University of Phoenix. So um, I got the same degree from Penn State. Now, Penn State, that's a reputable college. I'd be proud to put that one on there. But I went to University of Phoenix. So um, doing A plus network plus school, but only taking the A plus exam. What what jobs should I apply for after? Um, I can show you how to find a job. Here's how you do it. Let me show you live. We're going to do this live. We'll do it live. All right. So it's it's not the way that I've been able to get jobs, high paying, good jobs is not aiming for a not aiming for a um, role, a specific role. So what you're going to do is you're going to get a good resume. Now, let me show you where you can get a good resume format. Uh, in my link description on my profile, you'll see a free resume, right? It'll take you straight there. But if you if if you happen to be on the website, you'll go here. Now, I don't know how long I'm going to do this for free because, man, people really like this thing. So that means I have to pay. I've got to I probably should be charging for this. But for right now, it's free. This is the format you need for resumes. Um. This is not the right one. I'm. So, I apologize. <laughs> this is too. This is a two hundred dollar course. Okay, but you want free, so let's go free. Uh, my course walks you through all of this, by the way, and you can you can talk to me directly. Where is it? Oh, here it is, right here. It's up top. Okay, enroll for free, and then you can download the resume right here. It's an ATS style resume. What, what that means is um, uh, it's application tracking software resume. And it's just a simplified breakdown of a resume that uh, is very simple, very, very simple. But what you want to do is fill that out, put your certification on there, put your experience in school. Um, I would recommend uh, if you even volunteer in the school to get some experience under your belt doing IT. Once you do that, once you get something on your resume, download my resume for an example of how you write it. You're going to go to LinkedIn. Uh, actually, let's go to Indeed first. Indeed.com. Indeed. I think I typed in the wrong thing. Indeed.com. Indeed.com. You're going to upload your resume. So you're going to sign in or register and then you're going to upload your resume to this site all right and you're not going to stop there what you're also going to do is go to linkedin linkedin and you see this see how this is completely filled out you can follow me on linkedin and copy exactly what i'm doing See what I'm doing here? I have a profile picture. I put even put the damn background here. Put some random background here. This thing is completely filled out. Completely. This top part, you want to fill this completely out, 100% of this thing. Now, you don't have to go crazy and put posts in there like I do. You don't have to do that. But what you do have to do is fill this thing out completely. All of your, your about section your um, all of your work experience, everything, fill it completely out. Now, if you don't have a lot of experience, it's fine. Just put your stuff in there. Put your skill sets in there. Put your uh, put your oh man, some people recommend me. That's kind of cool. Put everything in here. Now, what you want to do, you don't want to stop there. What you really want to do is put it on at least ten different places. This is how you do it. Put it on a, at least 10 different uh, job sites. Put it on dice.com. Monster.com is a really good one. ZipRecruiter, uh, 10. Find 10 of them and do that same thing on all of them. Even as a student, you can literally do this right now. 
as a student, you could be doing this with your blank ass resume, ATS style. The reason why it's ATS style is because when you upload your resume, the site, some of these sites like LinkedIn is going to fill out some of it for you. It does a lot of the work for you. That being said, you still have to fill out the rest of the profile. You want to fill that out as much as possible. What happens is once you do this is that the algorithm that's in LinkedIn, that's in Dice, that's in Monster, that's in all ZipRecruiter, all these other ones, it will literally start to match you up with certain jobs. It'll start to match you up with jobs. Even if you have little to no experience, it'll match you up with help desk, techn low technical jobs. It'll match you up with those. You don't want to stop there. Then what you want to do is start applying for jobs that you're qualified for. This is how I've been able to do. I tell people this, and I don't know how many people are listening to me, but I'm telling you, my life is different because I do the things I'm telling you to do. The biggest course that I have on my site is risk management framework. I sell so many of those over the years. I've sold so many risk management framework. I think it's cool because the way I teach it and not many people are teaching it for as low of a cost. But the, the best course that I have is the one I just showed you. Because my life is different. My life is different. I, there's a recession. I've been doing this since 2008. And during 2008, I was doing this. I always had a job. It. I, I'm not my my work, my job is not affected by the recession. That's how good this thing works. What I just told you works. Put your resume on every platform that you can think of. And then mark, that's how you market yourself. Now you need to have keywords on there. You know, like a lot of times IT people come to me and they're like, hey Bruce, like I can't, I've been working this job for 10 years. I'm in the, I'm in the Denver, I'm in the Maryland, D.C. area, it pays so high, but I'm only making 40. Like, I'm trying to level up. I'm like, man, it's your resume. What do you mean? My re I have a resume. It's got three pages on it, and I'll, I'll take a look at the resume. There's no security stuff on it. They want a security job, a cybersecurity job, but there's no cybersecurity stuff on it. If you want a cybersecurity job, you have to put the cybersecurity best practices on there. Now, if you've been doing IT for some time, you've done cybersecurity. It's not all hacking. Cyber newsflash, cybersecurity, everybody, cybersecurity <laughs> is not just hacking. Cybersecurity is updating patches. Cybersecurity is updating uh, virus definitions, basic stuff. Cybersecurity is looking at the logs, the audit logs that are on, turning the audit logs on. Cybersecurity is putting the, the security features on the system. Like if you ever set up a laptop in your organization and you had to turn on security features, you had to turn on the host space firewall, you had to turn on the, you know, you had to make accounts, all that stuff, cybersecurity. You just got to put it on your resume. If it's not on your resume, they're not going to know that you have done cybersecurity. Once you put all that stuff on your resume, upload it on all those places. And then what you do, once you've uploaded all those places, start applying for jobs all over the place. That's that's what I've done, and it's worked. I've not been without a job. Okay, someone said, um, um, starting a junior information assurance job with the Department of Defense next week. Started in an IT role to get my foot in the door. This is this is a smart man right here. Leveled up. Because of your content. Whoa. Uh, from one vet to another, thank you. Wow, thanks, man. You're gonna make me cry, man. <laughs> I was I was thought it was a question. I appreciate that, man. Thanks for the thanks for the 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 message. I appreciate that. It means a lot. So yeah, this this guy just said exactly what I'm telling you to do. If you, especially if you're already in IT and you want to level up, cybersecurity specialization pays way more than IT. When I first got out of the military, all I wanted to do was like some hardcore Unix. I was wanted to be a Unix guy or I wanted to like be a pen tester. Or I wanted to do all this fancy stuff. 
And I did that, but they are only paying me like 45, which is great for some people. Okay. That's if you make 45, I'm not trying to, you know, that's great. But I was like, really, I wanted to stay there because my, I was, I was learning a lot of things. I had a lot of fun, but the organization, uh, wasn't very good. So, so what I did, so the, the organization wasn't that good. So I left, I put my resume out there as a cybersecurity person, as a risk management framework person. So I put it out there and immediately made 15% more. Like I went from 45 a year. Now with our travel, we were making like 70 or something, you know, but the travel was a lot and I had a little kid. So it was like, this is too much. So I left that job, went to a cybersecurity job, instantly 15% more. And then when I got the certification that they wanted, they wanted me to get a CISSP. And I was like, damn, they wanted me to get it within a year. I did it. Um, I did it within uh, within a year and a half, two years, something like that. And after that, man, uh, the, the after that, like just start leveling up. So start off with just normal IT, basic stuff. Put you got to put your cybersecurity experience on your resume, then just post it everywhere. Post it everywhere. You will get offers. Now, I can't promise you every offer is going to be good or great or whatever, but I can tell you, you will get offers and uh, you will get opportunities, I should say. And some of those are going to can be life changing. Um, Bruce passed my cap. Uh, did you get my certification? Did uh, did not get my certification yet. How should I prove uh, this if the employer asks? Oh, yeah, you just um, let me see if I can show you real quick. So you let me log into the site. ISC2, ISC2 cap. Oh, by the way, the cap is changing. So the cap, they're going to make it a little bit more marketable. They're changing the name of it to it. Man, why do I keep going on this boot camp? They're changing the name of it from uh, cap to CGRC. CG, CGRC. Yeah, CGRC. Let me show you what I mean here. I'm just going to fucking just navigate to this site real quick. Um, actually, can I just log in? Nah, it's too much personal stuff. But I'll show you. Let me show you the site. You will get access to this site here. Let me just show you what I'm talking about as I'm speaking here. Here it is right here. So here's the site. It's uh, ISC2. Here, let me let me uh, zoom into this thing. Sorry about that. Apologize. This is the site right here. ISC2. This You'll log in to the site. They'll give you access to the site right here. You log in and then they'll have a certificate for you. You take that, give it to your employer. And um, and that's it. And then also, you should know if you just took the cap that they're changing this name, Certified Authorization Professional, to Governance, Risk, and Compliance. Certified in Governance, Risk, and Compliance. The significance of this is is big because this is actually a more marketable term. And um, IC2 Square is very they're very smart about marketing their certifications. They're almost as smart as um, the the uh, e council guys, the the CEH guys. Those guys are some. They are the McDonald's of certifications, man. I I could tell you like when that certification first came out, that CEH. People are like, this is a scam. And they they turned their reputation from scam to uh, being one of the top certifications. And regardless of whether the certification is good, like some certifications I've taken are BS. But it's marketable once you get it, once you put on your certification, and once you put it on your resume. People are like, oh, he has the CEH. Oh my God, mercy me. Like we have to pay him a hundred thousand, you know. <laughs> but you took the certification, you're like, this is bullshit. <laughs> I'll tell you, man, there's some certifications like that. CEH is next. Yeah, CEH is no joke, man. That pay CEH pays. Pays like crazy. 
Um, the, the hackers and the pen testers hate that cert, but that's it's it pays. Um, just gradu graduated from Keesler. Oh man, seriously, just graduated from Keesler. Got my security plus and got my my top secret clearance. Oh man, you're made, buddy. You're a made man. <laughs> you are a made man. If you got a top secret clearance, let me tell you something. When you get out, now all you need is experience. If you have, if you have a uh, security plus, and you have a top secret clearance, and you've got yourself about six months of experience in the career field doing IT stuff, security stuff in particular, and you put that on your resume, when you get out. Um, yeah, by the time you get out, you can make six figures. I'm an RN. Which one is best for me? Okay. Healthcare professionals are my favorite because it's easy. Watch this. Check this out. I'm about to blow your mind. Okay. So, and I'm on the right side too. Check this out. This is crazy. This is going to, this is, so the healthcare career field is really looking for professionals. And I want to show you what I mean here. Well, first of all, let me answer your question. Your question was, which one should you take? So it depends on how much you know. If you are already tech savvy, you may be able to skip the first couple steps. I would first take, um, there's a couple of things you can do. You can do, you need an entry level certification. Here's one you could do. This is an entry level cert, certified in cybersecurity. Entry level, no experience needed. There's one. But let me show you another one. Uh, CompTIA. This was my first certificate certification. And it's really good for teaching you the basics, te learning the ropes. Because IT security, you're going to have to know. You don't have to have experience, but you do have to know. Uh, man, where the hell is this thing? CompTIA. You, you do have to know IT. You do have to know IT. I'm looking for it right now, so bear with me. Here it is. Okay. So this is, I went to comptia.org to get here. And this A-plus certification teaches you the basics of what you need to know for IT stuff. You can literally just go to Barnes & Noble and buy the book. You don't have to take a boot camp that's 80 grand or 20 grand or 10 grand, whatever it is. You can literally just buy a book and study for it and and, and do the test. So comptia.org. And this is not, where's their damn site at? This is not what I was, where is the, all right, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Comptia, A plus certification is what I'm looking for. And they have it on Coursera. Udemy is pretty good, too. This is a pretty cheap way to, to learn. I do not teach this, um, these certifications just yet. So I would recommend like uh, Udemy or, or uh, Coursera or something like that. And if this is your first time taking uh, Udemy, you, you can get this for like 20 bucks. And this is like a $100 course. Um, it's, it's not going to be easy for first timers. I can tell you that it's not going to be easy, but if you're a first timer, this is, you know, this is a good one to, to, to go through because it's going to teach you all the basics that you need to know for IT. Now, let me show you what I'm excited about for uh, professionals, for um, healthcare professionals. So if you go here to ISC2 squared, they have a certification specifically for professionals in the healthcare industry. And it's called this one right here. Check this out. So this is literally for healthcare professionals because you guys protect a certain amount of uh, certain kinds of data. Healthcare security certification. And this certification is no joke. It's already getting notoriety. Here it is right here. Now, you're going to have to know basic IT first before you take a certification like that. But 
uh, once you know the basics of IT, you want to do, um, you want to go through and, and get this specialization in healthcare, this HCISPP. And somebody said, what, what's the website? So the, the first website is just CompTIA A plus certification. The second website is ISC2 squared, ISC2, ISC2. Let me see if I can type it. Um, I can't type it. Somebody type that one. There's some sharp dudes in here that know, know exactly what we're talking about. Um, type in isc2.org. That's the, that's the site that I'm at. How do I learn basics? The basics you can, there's a several ways you can learn the basics. You can go to Udemy, uh, Google Udemy, uh, .com. Udemy has a, uh, a really good training for entry level positions. Uh, you go to Udemy and then type in A plus certification. That'll have all the basic stuff you need to know. It's going to teach you the basics of hardware and software. It's going to no you Udemy with a Y. Udemy with a with a Y. <laughs> U D E M Y. So can somebody type in the correct there you go. Udemy, thank you. <laughs> so Udemy with a Y. So you want to go there, type in A plus certification. A plus is going to tell you uh hardware, software. It's going to tell you um, a little bit about security in context of the computer of computers, how computers work, how to troubleshoot computers, all the basics that you need to know. Do you need to take the certification? It's up to you. You don't you don't have to. But I'm just trying to get you to learn the actual basics of IT. After that, once you know the basics, you can take the certification. It's pretty marketable. After that, though, after you get that certification, A plus certification, and you're very confident with fixing your own computer. You're the resident geek fixing your kid's computer, fixing your neighbor's computer, fixing your mom's computer, and you know the basics of everything. Then you want to specialize in, in that healthcare one, something like that. You could do the A plus or the M plus or just go in and study the security plus. Yeah, security plus is if you can do the security plus, if you already have, if you're tech savvy, go straight for the security plus. I don't have a hundred dollars for uh, the course. Yeah, so Udemy with Udemy, if it's your first time, it's only like twenty dollars. And uh, actually, you don't even need to go to an online course. You can do. You can uh, buy a book. You can buy a. Uh, as a CompTIA has like a thirty dollar book that you can get, and just that's what I do. Like whenever I go for a certification, I buy the book. Like I buy the hard copy book, and I go through it and start marketing it. And then I'll make notes based off the book, and then I study my notes. Then I go take the certification. I I don't really do like videos are cool, but for me personally, the book works better for me personally when I'm studying by myself. Which cert employers, which certifications do employers care more for security or network? Depends on depends on the job. Um, depends on the job. So let me give you an example. If you're going for a network engineering job, they would probably want a networking uh, certification. They want a network engineering certification. If you're going for a job like myself, like a recent job that I got was for um, an information system security officer position, they were really looking for me to have a security certification. They're looking for specific security certifications. They wanted us to either have a CISA or a CISSP or a security plus. For that position they weren't worried at all about networks uh, certifications uh, so it depends on the position somebody said professor messer um, has a great youtube playlist that just got um got me security plus as well as uh, as cert killer um i've heard a lot about professor messer and that's on uh youtube that's free yeah you don't have to pay a dime a friend of mine even had like a, a cheat sheet. She had a cheat sheet that she developed that had all the basics of Security Plus. Um, it wasn't literally the answers to the to the test. It was it was just like all the basics that you need to know for Security Plus. It was really good. I wonder if she's still out there. Um, what do you think about the recent mass tech layoffs? Oh, I could speak on this one. 
So what do I think? The question is, what do I think about the mass tech layoffs? So I, it's mostly happening in FANG. And FANG stands for Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, Netflix, and Google. And then I would throw uh, Twitter in there. So all those guys pay a lot of money. They all pay like upwards of 200000 So whenever somebody you see somebody on TikTok or YouTube saying, I make $200,000 and I'm an IT person. I'm a software engineer. I'm a cybersecurity expert and I make $200,000, $250,000. They're working for one of those organizations because those guys pay a lot. But however, however, comma, <laughs> you got stuff like this. The recession is not doing too good. So their stocks are not too great. So there's, there's a couple things happening all at once. They're having like a jackpot moment. Several things, ap apocalyptic things are happening. Apocalypse one, poor management. Uh, so Zuckerberg is changing Facebook to metaverse and is spending billions of dollars to completely, to put everything into this dream of having everybody have a visor over their face. It could happen, maybe. They'll be the first ones in the in the gate if that if it works. Something good is going to come out of it. I don't know what, but something good is going to come out of it. But in the meantime, he's had to lay off like 11,000 people. And then Twitter, you already know, Elon Musk. Like Elon Musk, what he does is he he's – if you look at his track record, if you look at what he did with Tesla, if you look at what he did with SpaceX, he breaks the crap out of the system. He'll blow stuff up over and over again until he gets things right. And that's exactly what he's doing with Twitter. He's, he just breaks the crap out of it over and over and over again until they get it right. And that's what he's doing. He just gets in there. He's got so much hubris. He's a real smart dude. Gets in there, breaks the crap out of everything. He doesn't give a damn about money because he has a he's a, one of the richest people in the world. So just break the crap out. And that's what's happening. And as a result, you got like 3,000 people getting laid off. He doesn't care about humans. So there you go. <laughs> and then you got the recession, which is hitting the stocks of – Amazon is starting to automate everything. Um, Google is laying people off. Like all these big tech, it's just, it's just part of the economy. So um, what do I think about it? Like I still think there's opportunities out there, but they're just not in the fang. Uh, they're just not in fang. They're in infrastructure. They're in the Department of Defense. They're in the Department of Labor. They're in USDA. They're in uh, critical infrastructure for the for the state and local government, but also for the federal government. We need people. So all those people, all you guys who are in FANG or who are making $250,000, there's so many jobs out here. Now it's not going to make pay, you know, $250,000. It's not going to pay, you know, it's not, it's not like that, but are there jobs? Yes, absolutely. There's so many jobs for the government, for critical, critical infrastructure, for, uh, the, the technical, the, uh, Telecoms need people to do cybersecurity, to do networking, network engineering, to do all the stuff you do in the the big four. They you, you need them also in uh, in the rest of the industries. You know the big four being, well, I guess it's more than four, but uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Network, Google, Tech, uh, Twitter, all those guys. Yeah, um, they're affected directly by the stocks. And if stocks aren't doing well, like Facebook and Twitter, because they're flipping the whole damn thing over to do something totally different, or if the economy's not good, stocks aren't good, business isn't good, they got to lay people off. That's what's happening. But are there still jobs? Yeah, there's still jobs out there. They're just not in, the, in those top. He cares about people at large scale. Example, uh, electric cars, a uh, space colonization. Yeah, um, I think he's he he'll he's willing to break a few eggs is what I meant. Yeah, he's um, if you want if you want an omelet, you got to break a few eggs. So that means some of his cars are going to crash and people are going to die. That means that some of the aircraft's going to blow up. And it's like got to break a few eggs. That's what I mean. <laughs> you know, long large scale. Like he's he's thinking hundreds of years in he's not thinking you know about your life is what i mean like your life he doesn't care about <laughs> not he doesn't care about your life he cares about all of humanity's life i guess i should say 
but state and local government pass way uh, pass uh, pay way below the experience of infrastructure and security professionals. Um. Well, perhaps, but what if you? What if? What if? What if? What if you worked from home part time and you made a hundred thousand? And then, and then, and then you worked another part time job making the same amount. That's something you could do in theory. Um, another thing is you don't want to work directly for the state. Another option to make more money is to work for the contracting organizations that work for the state. If you work directly for the state or local government, you're right. They don't pay very much. Um, they, they pay way below the market value of a, a cybersecurity guy or cloud or cloud guy like yourself. Um, you want to work for a cloud organization who has two or three different contracts with the federal government. And then those guys have a multi-million, like $100 million contract, and they can afford to pay you $150,000, $200,000 or whatever. That's how you do it. You know, but there, there's many different options that'll get you there, but you don't have to work directly for the government, you know. So another thing you can do is you can make your own LLC or own S corporation or whatever and, and get your own contracts, which is what a lot of people do, are doing. And that contract could be a multi-million dollar contract. If you happen to know how to do cloud stuff, now you got to go through all the stupid paces of getting on SAM.gov and getting a stupid Dunn's number and getting a freaking cage number and all this other BS you got to do. You got to do all that stuff. But once you get that and you get on there, you can actually bid, make bids for these contracts and you could act literally, you know, people are getting out of fang who could, who know, have all the skills in their head how to do all of these, solve these problems that the government has. There's millions of dollars out there for that, for that kind of work. And I, I work for those people. That's why I know, you know, I've tried to get those certain, those, those uh, contract. I just don't have the contracting skill set or whatever it takes to get those jobs. Okay. Let me see. Somebody said, hi, Bruce passed my cap. Um, did not get the certification though. How do I prove? Okay. I already, I already read that one. Need to endorse first. I was told, um, Oh, you need an endorsement. Um, so you would just talk to somebody. If you have a cap and you need an endorsement, talk to somebody you know who has a cap or a CISSP, and then they can be your endorser. They can just they basically have a sign and saying, yes, um, Jermaine knows he's been doing IT work for X amount of time. So that's all you do today. It's pretty easy. Somebody just needs to kind of uh, vouch for your for your experience in the in the field that's that's all it's pretty easy um let me see hello i want to start an it field uh career but i but i have to but i have to have prior experience or knowledge where can i start so um so to get into IT career field, you do have to have the knowledge. Um, you do have to. I would I would recommend knowing a little something. Take an entry level certification. If you can't go get a degree, right? If that's not an option for you, you don't have the resources for it. You just don't want to spend the money because it's there. It's highway robbery. I understand. I totally understand. You can just go ahead and get a certification. Certifications that I would recommend. CompTIA A plus is a good entry level certification. Entry level certification. Um, another one would be Google Support IT entry level certification. It's letting you know the common body of knowledge that you need to know to get into this field. To the basic things that you need to know. Things like how does a computer work? How does the RAM work with the CPU? Work with the storage, right? Because in in cybersecurity, um, that's the first place some of the malware will attack you know and then in in uh even in network if you want to specialize in networking well a network router is a computer you know so whatever you specialize in you have to know the basics so uh google support it is a good entry level cert just to know what's going on to understand it another it's not going to make you a hundred thousand dollars like these guys are saying 
like all these ads saying, oh, it's going to make you $100,000 as soon as you know. Absolutely not. No, nobody's going to pay you $100,000 for entry level certification. Unless you have. OK, there's caveats. If you have a if you have a, a top secret clearance and live in Maryland, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but nobody's paying 100K for just the entry level and you don't know anything. So experience is king here. Experience is what they really want. It's what they really pay for. Uh, IT certifications is just a check mark saying that this guy knows what they're talking about, or this guy knows a certain level of knowledge, or this person has some experience. That's all a certification does. That being said, it is a great way to get your foot in the door. It's a great way to learn the information. Um, that's how I learned. I, I, um, I did. I was in the military at the time, and I was. I went to a school, but the the A plus certification broke it down in such a way that I had a comprehensive knowledge of of how, not only how to fix them, but how to speak on uh, how to speak the language of I, an IT person. So my first move as an entry level person would be to get an entry level certification. I would recommend. If you know nothing at all, A plus certification, CompTIA, uh, Google, CompTIA A plus, um, CompTIA Security Plus, if you can handle it, Google uh, support IT as an entry level cert. Once you get those in the, once you understand what's going on with those, or you pass those certs, or one of those certs, go for a um, entry level cloud certification because it pays a lot. AWS uh, practitioner doesn't require any experience but once you get that on your belt man so many employers are looking for that right now just basic knowledge they're looking for because it's the wild wild west like somebody said on here to to get into to, into uh cloud technology um are you experienced in cybersecurity? sorry if i will if i was answered or if it was our answer already yes so my main, the main thing I do is cybersecurity. I do specifically, I do cybersecurity compliance. So there's many different levels and layers and categories of cybersecurity. It's not just pen testing. It's not just hacking. The part that I do is called compliance. And so that's my specialty. Now, have I done other things? Yeah, I did uh, cybersecurity analyst work. Um, I, one time I was doing network engineering. I did um, all many different parts, but the one that I'm really deep on is um, is cybersecurity compliance. That's my specialty. Um, let me see. Somebody said, wait, what was that? Somebody said, I have a degree. Somebody said, oh, I got to answer this one. What was that? I have a degree in cybersecurity. I have a degree in cyber and a security plus not getting looked at. <sighs> it's your resume. Seth, I, I want to ask you a question. How many years of experience do you have? And um, have you, where's your resume posted at? Because I, I know the problem. Several people have said this to me. If you have a degree, you have a security plus, then what you need to do is put that on your resume. Now, if you have any experience whatsoever, you got to put that on your resume. Um, and then you need to advertise your resume. You need to market the crap out of your resume. Put it everywhere. Put it on LinkedIn. Put it on Indeed.com. Put it on Monster, on Dice, on Career Builder. Put it on at least 10, 10 places. Put it everywhere. You also need to put keywords on your resume, keywords of cybersecurity stuff that you have done. Now, if you have no experience at all, but you have a security plus and you have a cybersecurity um, or any kind of certification um, degree, any kind of degree or a security and a security plus, what you could do is what I would do is I would look for entry level positions. I would look for entry level positions uh, doing help desk entry. You can just go to Indeed.com, type in help desk entry level. You'll find jobs there. They don't pay a lot, but what you want to do is get your experience so that you can put it on your resume. Uh, another thing you can do is is, is uh, look for um, um, what's called apprenticeships. 
Again, go to Google, type in apprenticeships, boom. Uh, let me see here. Um, Tom the Cloud Guy says, A plus is a great foundational, is great for foundational knowledge. I agree with that. Uh, temporary work, yes, is in like help desk or system admin roles. Exactly. This guy knows what he's talking about. Um, I really want a security analyst role, though. Yeah, so Seth, you got to start somewhere, man. Like, you got to start somewhere. You, you know, you're not. So what I'm trying to tell you is, like, what what these guys are looking for is, is ultimately experience, right? In the beginning, what you want to do is get experience on your resume. That's what you're trying to do. You might only work there for three, four months, six months, something like that. But as you're working, you're putting that experience on your resume. And what's really important is working for an organization who's doing large scale uh, technology. Well, it doesn't have to be a large company or even a medium sized company. But you want to do like, let's say you had a local tire world or something and you worked as their IT guy. Well, the thing is, tire world has customer data at stake. So something at stake there. They're protecting real world information. So you got to put that on your resume. Build yourself up to a, a security analyst role. And then where do you live? Because actually you can you should be able to get a, a, a entry level uh, security analyst role. You should be able to get one. If you have a degree and you have a, a, a security plus, you should be able to get an entry level security you know what? I'm just going to show you. Watch this. I'm going to go to Indeed.com. Let me show you how I would do it. And maybe I'm lying. Maybe I'm going to show you live what I'm going to do. And maybe maybe I'm wrong. All right. Let me see if I can show, show this. Um, don't worry. I'll make the screen bigger. Just got to switch this up okay here we go so look here's why i am i'm on d indeed.com you can follow along with me i'm going to type in entry level cyber security analyst cyber if i could spell <laughs> cyber security analyst watch this first of all look how many jobs there are for this See that? 670 jobs ready, ready for you to apply. Another thing we need to do is look at the date. Let's let's make sure that these are posted within the last 14 days. Fit only 15 jobs in the last 14 days. So these jobs are very fairly new. Look at this. This is a remote position. Cybersecurity analyst remote position. Let's see. What do they need? remote position you want to focus on the uh on the um responsibilities and the requirements is what you really want to focus on now i don't know if you match these requirements or the job description or if you feel like you could do this stuff but this is kind of the search you want to do look at this they're looking for a knowledge in nist CMMC, security frameworks. Now, entry level positions, a lot of times it seems deceptive. They're not looking for somebody who has zero experience. And this is why I say uh, your next step is to get that experience. But look, let's look at this one here. Governance, but you didn't really want this one, even though it says analyst. So let's keep going. Entry level cybersecurity. Let's look at this one right here. This is what I would do if I were you. Look for these entry level positions. Look at this. This is looking for a bachelor's degree. A minimum, look at this, a minimum of six months of experience. See that? That's why I'm saying, like, get that six months of experience under your belt. Flexible environment. This is this is how you search for it. And in the beginning, what you probably want to do is just type in 
entry level cybersecurity, just cybersecurity. Just cybersecurity, because this is going to have way more jobs available to you. Let's make sure that these are only within the last 14 days. Okay, that's still 200 jobs. And then if you've already put your resume up, you can click this right here and instantly your, your stuff is submitted to them with everything that they need. And here's another one, easy apply. Now, see, this is, that's a, I don't know why that came up, but information security analyst program. You just want to go through these and find the one that you, there's so many jobs that are entry level in Colorado, but it's remote. You got to look for what they're what what are they looking for? Sometimes what you can do, like let's say you don't know what SOX is, research it. You don't know what PCI is, research it. Because sometimes they just want you to know what it is. They want you to know, you know, what what that is. They're not necessarily knowledge of NIST. That's what I would do if I were you. Now, that being said, you have to have a, a decent resume. If you don't know, if you're curious on how to find a good resume, um, you could use mine. If you go in my link in description below or if you go to uh, my um, my bio, I have a damp. You can download my resume, which I've used to actually get jobs and use that. It has an ATS style, which means application tracking software it's made so that it can be uploaded directly into these application soft uh, software uh, databases that's uh it syncs all of your uh skill sets and everything in there your certification your degrees everything and um makes it a lot easier to apply for a lot of different jobs so that's what i would do um you're, you're halfway you're more than halfway there you know you're just missing a few steps All right, guys, uh, I got a, a, so many questions here. Um, do you recommend the certified professional compliance? Okay, this is going to be a lot, my last uh, question. Do you recommend the certified professional compliance officer for a nurse? Um, absolutely. But here's a, in addition to that one, I would also recommend this certification here. We were just talking about this earlier, but I'll show you what I'm talking about. It's from ISC2 squared, and it's called um, HCISPP. Now, the reason why I recommend this one is because it's it's actually very marketable, and the ISC2 squared is a one of the top certification organizations out there. This one right here is a real good certification to get. I see two squares, the guys who do uh, CISSP. CISSP is, is arguably one of the top certifications in the world, one of the top cybersecurity certifications in the world. And now these guys have this one right here for healthcare professionals. I would highly recommend this one. At least check it out. Yep, this is a really good one. All right, guys, I think that's about it for me. If you guys are interested, I have a podcast. It's on uh, podbean, convocourses.podbean.com. I also have a site, convocourses.com. Check it out um, where I'm teaching uh, how to do everything I'm teaching here. Everything I'm telling you guys how to do, it's on convocourses.com. If you want free stuff, it's on convocourses.com. If you want more free stuff, YouTube. Check me out on YouTube, but here's my site right here. This is free right here, downloadable. This is my actual free resume, ATS style resume with sample information, not just the format. Uh, there's YouTube. Um, there's some books. If you go to Amazon, if you're a reader, if you're a listener, you can actually listen to these books. Look at that. You can listen to my books. Everything I'm saying here is on these books. 
in great detail. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate everybody. I will talk to you guys next week.